Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by The Trek. I'm your co-host, Zach Badger Davis. Sitting to my right is... I am Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chance. I'm going to do a new thing for Question of the Day. I'm going to push it. I'm going to push it into the segments. Okay. I want people's feedback on whether they like that better or worse. But I want to get more to the backpacking at the top of the show. This is like an SNL cold open. Yeah. Except we're announcing it. I feel like that always happens after like a depressing moment. This is a joyous moment. Okay. But Happy. Just experimenting, trying new things. Okay. Give us the feedback, guys. Uh, I will say one quick reminder b- before we get started here is that if you guys want even more Backpacker Radio, we have a Patreon page where we do a dedicated episode the first Wednesday of every month. We've had some pretty wild ones. Should I play them the clip from the last one? Yeah. Okay. You talk for a second. I love it because it doesn't include any, really any of the... Yeah, it's just... I don't even remember how this came up. Like, I don't even know the context at this point. I vaguely recall, but it doesn't matter. (laughs) How much would someone have to pay you? (laughs) To punch the poop out of my butt? (laughs) Wrap toilet paper around your fist and go for it? punching it? (laughs) Okay, yeah. That may be the first time we've played a clip of Backpacker Radio on Backpacker, on Backpacker Radio. Backpacker it feels Radio. a little gross, Inception. but it does get it does get weird. I won't say it's good, but it gets certainly very weird. Yeah, I mean, right there we're talking about punching poop off my butthole. So. Yeah. <laughs> to that, let's get to today's interview. Uh, Lila Harad? Herod. Herod, yeah. Herod, okay. Is a sober queer transgender woman with an impressive number of trail miles under her shoes. Lila has hiked the AT Bay Circuit Trail, Arizona Trail, PCT, Hey Duke, Florida Trail, and is now on the CDT. Lila, thank you so much for joining us here on Backpacker Radio. Yeah, thanks for having me, y'all. What got you into backpacking? The requisite question. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I I moved when I was like in my early 20s. I moved out to Seattle and um, I had a friend who was like super into day hiking and like weekend trips and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I mean, it's really easy to fall in love with backpacking when you're in the Northern Cascades. Um, so I spent a lot of time out there and in the Olympics and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And um, then a couple years later, I moved back to the East Coast and, you know, kind of delved more into the White Mountains. And um, yeah, I just kind of grew from grew from there over the next, that was... 13 years ago. Do you have any short backpacking? This is a selfish question. Short backpacking gems up in the Cascades that you can recommend? Oh my God. In the Cascades, it's been, it's been quite a number of years since I was there, except for the PCT. So the PCT in the Northern Cascades is really good. Otherwise you'd have to ask uh, someone who's lived there more recently. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I will. uh, This is going to be out of date by the time this airs today. It's June 20th. Did you see the photos yesterday of Stevens Pass and Timberline Lodge and they got hit with snow recently yeah yesterday these oh, no are the, the camera footage from like the little like visitor center yeah. cameras i sent them to fireball because she's starting southbound oh, pretty soon holy shit. yeah they got snow yeah the good news is snow this time of the year cooks off pretty quickly but oh, uh <laughs> yeah that would not be a fun thing to wake up and see that your tents under four inches of snow or whatever that is yeah so happy pcts yeah uh, what is your trail name? I know it, but give us yeah. the origin story behind that. Yeah, yeah. So my, my trail name is Sugar um, because of my crappy diet. Um, yeah, I mean, people, you know, I think like the actual deeper story behind it is that um, since I'm sober, um, you know, I think that I, I, I didn't really even used to like sweets and like cakes and stuff like that mm. when I was drinking. But after I stopped drinking, I think there's just so much sugar in alcohol that mm. like I had developed an addiction to sugar as well. So now that's like that's like my vice. Like I get sugar, you know. Sure. So and I take full advantage of that vice yeah. every day. And when you're pulling the miles that you're pulling, you can get away with the sugar very easily. I can. I, I wish I could say that I stopped that after um, hiking season two, but it's pretty much it's it's a lifestyle choice. Yeah, for sure. Give us your top three candies. Oh my god. Okay, so for right now, it's this one I have right here on the table. Yeah. Sour, these are Sour Patch Kids, the lemonade fast ones. I've never seen. Uh, flavor variations of Sour Patch Kids. Oh, there's a whole bunch. Go into a <laughs> Josh Dollar just General. Gave me the dirtiest look of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you live on this tell you. <laughs> you yeah, ever been no, inside a gas station? <laughs> this one's a banger. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen it before this year or whatever, but if you check out Dollar General, I think they must have not been selling well because I think that's sort of how Dollar General does mm. it, you know, like overstock. Yeah. Um, so these ones are bangers. Um, my like all time favorite is the Haribo Sour Streamers. Have y'all seen those? They're like. Yes, Google them. If you're at home, Google these. Take a look. Try them out. They are the best, like, most flavorful, sourest candy that I have found on the market. 
Um, they do sell out a good amount because, like, you know, the secret is somewhat out about this wonderful product. <laughs> I like out. that you turned into me as if I don't know. You, oh, you know all the stuff. I know my oh, you know this okay. one. I'm, I'm like you. I, there's a reason I went to the dentist today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, how did you? How did your mouth get to adult. be like this? And I'm like, well, it's a long story. There's a lot of miles. And yeah, dude. I I didn't really. S- since starting through hiking i have been so intense about flossing like i am on top of it Mm. every night catch me catch me flossing because like i don't have dental insurance so we're risking it all yeah sure it yeah for something that takes 60 seconds and the material is very cheap that's definitely a good roi yeah and if you're already sitting in the tent you know like just kicking it before bed or whatever anyway what's two what's two minutes for a little peace of mind Uh, i will say i so i went to the dentist today and we were talking before the show about just like how great the dentist i go to is this is this is relevant because it's useful for people hiking and listening but when i hike i use my toothbrush and i brush my teeth and right now my problem is like my gums need some need some help and the, I don't know why this doesn't happen often, but my dentist like explained it to me. Did as you if say I was five. when I'm hiking I brush my teeth? Is that imply that you don't brush your teeth? <laughs> no, and you're no, not no, no. That I don't floss. I don't oh, like to floss. Got it. You know, like that's my yeah. like. It, I just hate how it feels. Yeah. But I know you're supposed to do it. And so the dentist was explaining to me like I was five, which I loved. I needed that. Like I need to understand why I have to do a certain thing. And she was saying, like, brushing's for your teeth, flossing is for your gums. And I always thought flossing was to get the stuff out of between your teeth. Mm -hmm. But the friction that it puts on your gums helps your gums stay, like, firm and hard. And if you're not flossing and putting that friction on your gums, That's when they bleed when they they do all the dental stuff. I don't know why no one's ever explained that to me before. Mm. But it made the way she explained it made so much sense for why you can't just brush. You have to brush and floss. Yeah. So if you're on trail and you're only brushing pickups and floss. Yeah. She says the the picks that have the single use floss suck and to use the string. Mm. Did we did I miss it? Did we get the third one? Yes. The third candy? Oh, um, okay, so I'll just go with one that's like hot right now in my life. (laughs) And it's the the Snickers peanut butter ones. Thanks to my boy Bushwhack for introducing me to them. Um, yeah, they they come in the squares, you know what I'm talking about? They're like peanut butter and Snickers all up in one just like mess. And even when it's melted, it's you know equally as good yeah now you're speaking my language i'm more of a chocolate person oh okay right Right. on yeah yeah yeah. um okay let's get right into the backpacking stuffs so what led you to the ata we got the origin story but like what got you into the world of through hiking yeah yeah um so in 2020 when like you know remember like the very beginning of the pandemic full lockdown i don't know about you guys for me it felt like um like time didn't exist for the first few days. Sure. Like there was no like day or night or whatever because like there's no work, there's no any, there's nowhere to go. So I was like, I was staying up like crazy hours just like I got, fell into like the YouTube like through hiking documentary like rabbit hole and I watched a whole bunch of them. And you know, when you're like locked in the 10 by 10 room, you know, like fearing for your life or whatever, the idea of like uh, the total freedom of through hiking is really appealing. Hmm. Um, so that kind of like, really got made it stick in my head there and I kind of got the idea that I was like all right I'm gonna leave my job I felt like I've been there for a long time it was what was work on. at that point huh what were you doing for work oh uh, so like I've generally always been doing youth development type stuff mm. um, so at that time as a director of a community program um, so like I, I I mean I love my work but um, you know at the end of the day like there was a lot of like computers and writing and all that stuff and uh, that's you know I, uh, I I was ready for a change. I was ready for like for something big. So, yeah, those documentaries kind of got me going. So AT twenty twenty one, that so this is still kind of like the iffy time. I feel like generally speaking, the AT felt like it was open game. I know the ATC was kind of on the fence about it at the time, right? But people were so stir crazy from being locked in their houses from the previous year. Yeah, what was the scene like on the AT? And I guess if that was your first time out there you don't have much to compare it to so just give give us the full introduction to like what uh springer mountain was like in 2021 yeah yeah um so the like the decision to actually do the through hike that year i mean so i was working for a community program but i was like uh part of the school district as well so i actually got the um like all educators and people related to the public schools got Um, the vaccine like early or whatever. Mm. So I I was already vaccinated, so I didn't really have to worry about that quite as much. Um, But yeah, I I mean, I was in Massachusetts before that. So like 
the pandemic was a big time thing. Um, and then getting down to like Georgia and Tennessee and stuff, um, they just didn't take it. They, they just had different uh, approaches to handling the pandemic. To sure. It diplomatically. A lot fewer masks, I imagine. A lot fewer masks. It became like, um, you know, there's like the social pressure of in Massachusetts. Like if you're not wearing a mask, people would sort of like give you like the sting face or whatever. In Tennessee and Georgia, if you walk in with wearing a mask, you know, they're sort of like, you know, giving you the, giving you the stank face. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's even a huge, I'm sure I've talked about this on the podcast, but even like the difference between Golden, Colorado and Boulder, Colorado, which is where my folks live. Okay. Like that was, that felt like Massachusetts to, to, uh, to Georgia. Maybe yeah. Like so there's definitely, a, uh, there were, there was a cultural divide to navigate and everything there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how the numbers compa compared year to year to year, but like from how I understand it and from what I was telling you before, like having been working in Georgia this spring and seeing the bubble and everything, um, I think sort of the, the vibe is that the, you know, there's a big rush in 2021 of through hikers that kind of continued on through 2022 and then 2023, they're dipping a little bit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Letting you ask a question. Oh, I thought we were all just staring at me because I coughed. That's, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Picked a time where I wasn't ready. I was trying to hold in that cough for a while. Sheesh. Um, okay. Do we want to dive into the AT further or do we want to go into some background stuff? You're driving the ship. Okay. I want to jump. Steering the ship. Steering the ship. I want to go into the questions about hiking and being trans because I know that's a big part of like your story. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we have a lot of listeners where like their understanding will vary, you know, like we don't have just one type of listener. So there's a whole range. And I think getting to know like more of a person's background helps with the empathy with the later stuff. If someone doesn't fully get it, mm -hmm. are you comfortable talking about like pre-transitioning and what that was like and how you knew what you wanted to do and just the whole background that went into it before we get into the trail questions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and I think what you said is spot on, right? Like, I feel like so much of what I want people to understand about me and about trans people in general, right? Like, is like seeing our humanity and seeing that we're just like everybody else. <laughs> and, you know, um, because I think, you know, especially with the way that like our culture and, um, politics and news are it's so easy to dissociate or to, to separate out like people's humanity from the things that you're arguing about mm. so yeah understanding um understanding that makes a lot of sense so yeah ask away yeah i guess if you could just start with your story like who were you before you transitioned how did you get to that point what was it like just all yeah of it. yeah yeah for sure um so yeah i mean i grew up in in massachusetts in the 90s and everything and i think that the um I mean, y'all were around in the 90s enough to know it, to, you know what it was like. Um, yeah, like homophobia and things like that were kind of like the law of the land. Um, yeah, I remember growing up with lots of like homophobic jokes. Um, you know, oh, I, I like to mention this, that like the first time that I ever like became aware of a transgender person was from the movie Crocodile Dundee 2. Um, yes, yeah, I know y'all are like, that was a banger. Yeah. <laughs> an educational film. <laughs> yeah, such an educational film. I think it was like on TV or something one day when I was a kid. And um, it's like, he's this Australian dude. He go and in the second one, he goes to New York rather than them coming to Australia. And he's like, at a, he's at a bar and there's this pretty woman that comes up to him and uh, she offers to buy him a drink. And um, he's like, you know, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, sounds good, let me make a phone call first. He goes over to the like phone booth or whatever in the bar, and he's about to make his call, and this cabbie comes up to him, and he's just like, hey, you like that girl over there? You know, like, you know, like, basically like, you know, that girl, well, she's actually a guy, right? And uh, he's like, what? And he walks up to the bar, like walks back to the bar where she's like sitting there like, hey, how about that drink? Like, like let's do it. And he like reaches down and he grabs under her skirt, he grabs her genitals, right? Like, and she, and you know, and he's like, oh, it's like not a Sheila at all or whatever like Australian thing he says. And um, she like screams and cries and runs off and the entire bar just erupts in laughter. Hmm. Like, so that is like, that was the first time I was ever even made aware that anything like that, like, you know, like being a trans person could, could exist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I don't, that's not me. Like, I can't, you know, what, you know, how, how are you supposed to relate to something like that where you're basically being dehumanized, 
sexually assaulted and then ridiculed. Do you remember how old you were when you saw that movie? I mean, I think, I don't, I mean, you could Google when it came out, but I couldn't have been like somewhere in the middle school range, maybe something like, it was like on TV, you know? Did you know you were queer at that point or were you still figuring it out? Um, so I, I didn't know what transness was. Like the, the concept was, wasn't really something that I understood. Um, I, I knew throughout my life, like, especially like, you know, going through puberty and stuff like that, I could, I could feel that I was different than my peers. Um, but I, you don't necessarily know how, because, you know, you, you sort of, I was doing the checklist that was available to me at the time. Like, well, I, I'm not, I'm not gay, right? Like, I'm not like a man who loves other men kind of thing. Like that didn't feel right to me, but I don't know. People keep telling me I'm gay. Right. So, you know, it turns out they were right just in a different way than they thought. Um, but yeah, you just get used to, I mean, like you, you try to run through the options that are, that, that you're aware of. And when none of them felt right, like, you know, I knew that I, that I felt different, but um, it took me until way later to actually sort of like figure out what, what that meant for me. Um, you know, and, and I should say, like, I think that the reason why it did t took me to take me as long as it did was because of my substance use. Um, you know, sub like substance use is like, a number one coping strategy for mm -hmm. somebody who, um, you know, has addiction issues. And um, for me, like, I didn't have healthy coping strategies. Drinking and using was was my coping strategy. Hmm. Um, so that's a way to hide from yourself and to hide from others. Um, and you can uh, you can hide like that. Some people could live their, their whole lives um, just sort of like hiding. Um, and um, it's, it's a truly painful thing. Um, because you're never actually able to truly get to know yourself. Um, but I did find that once I, once I did get sober when I was 30 years old, there was no more uh, hiding from, from who I was, right? Like there was no more um, pretending. What, what year was this? Uh, so I'm 36 now, so I guess that would have been like 17? 2017 or so. Okay. Um, when I like sort of came out to myself and then like over like a slow process came out to my like loved ones and friends and everything. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so only through getting sober was I able to realize that I, that I, I, I had the capacity and the strength and the resources to be myself, mm -hmm. right? Like, and I had other, other skills now and I other, other, had other like coping strategies besides substance use to handle all the problems that come up um, and all the challenges that come up, like as you're coming out and as you're um, like beginning your transition. And you mentioned like you knew, okay, I'm not gay by the textbook definition, but people keep saying I am. Were you getting picked on a lot? Was there a lot of bullying? Like, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> um, no, I, I don't think so. <coughs> not so much that that would be like a major part of my story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think people could also sense that there was something different about me. Mm. Um, I, <coughs> I had a lot of really good friends and everything. Um, my social life w was just fine, but I think people could tell. I think mm. people could tell. Yeah. What was the reaction from family and friends when you did start to come out? Yeah, so um, my best friends, nothing but supportive, um, just really happy for me. They just gave me a big hug and told me they loved me. Um, my mom, um, she's also very, like, very, um, supportive and she loves me so much. I think that that's a, a different process. And I, I can't speak to what it's like to be in her shoes, but, um, I do remember that she talked about it feeling like there's a sort of a grieving process mm. to losing the son that she thought she had and realizing that in fact she had a daughter. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I tried to be uh, to be as respectful as possible of that, um, you know, that process for her. And um, yeah, she she very much she's my you know she's my number one supporter. She's my mom. Yeah, love you, mom. That must be a weird feeling for like the people around you that love you to have to go through a grieving process of like the person that you are. Is that I don't know. I don't know if that there's a question there, but. Maybe can you speak to that? Sure, yeah. No, that that would be really, really, really strange. And, and, and I do understand it. Um, you know, I think that, I think that you can understand that the core of it and what, and what I want 
you know, what those people need to understand generally, right, is that like, I am the same person. I always was this person, mm -hmm. right? Like, and maybe my performance, uh, sorry, my, um, not my performance, my uh, appearance is now sort of like reflecting who I've been. So the people, the person that they, they knew is still very much there, but there's like a conceptual idea um, that even though it doesn't feel like that for me on the inside, since, you know, I've been in, up here the whole time, right? I could understand how like socially and how all the, in the like personal ways it can feel a lot different for people who, um, who are, you know, supporting me through that. Mm -hmm. And I, I know when you mentioned Crocodile Dundee too, like that yeah, was- I'm so glad that got- <laughs> <into> <laughs> <that>. I'm so <laughs> glad it did too. That, <laughs> like that's a, a, when I think of movies from the nineties, like if you had to put one word to it, problematic is usually the main word. Like yeah. I don't know who was hired to direct these movies, but I should not have been allowed to watch them in my teens. I know, you it's know? so hard when you go back and you watch a movie and it's, it's just like it's ruined for you now, yeah. But to go from that to where you were when you turned 30 and you were able to you know, understand that I am trans, how are you getting more information about, like between Crocodile, Crocodile Dundee and realizing this is a thing, to getting enough information to taking it upon yourself? Like how, where are you getting that information from? What's your learning process like? Yeah, um, I think I would put myself in the, if there's queer people watching, you, you might identify with this. It's, I would put myself in the the ally to queer pipeline, you know, where I was like, I'm just a good ally, you know, like catch me at the pride parade, you know, like very much supporting my, my queer friends and everything, asking questions, um, getting involved with local LGBTQ um, organizations in, in my um, area, in my, my region. Um, so I think just by being around it and then like, I mean, also catch me with that late night Google search, like, you know, how do I know I'm trans? Like, I'm sure, you know, I think that, I think that kind of thing does happen for people. Um, Is there like a go-to resource in terms of a, a checklist of questions? Figuring out if you're trans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, such a good question. There, there is no, I'm, you can Google it and there like a billion lists will come up. I, I can't tell you like one specific one that you should check out because mm. at the end of the day, it's so subjective. Right. Right. Like um, I think the, you know, the super common test that I feel like people ask first is like if you could, if you were on a desert island so that none of like society didn't exist in the way that it does now, like, you know, the structures that exist that d don't exist now. If you were on a desert island and you could press a button and automatically become like, have the appearance of the gender that you, that you want to have, would you hit that button, hmm. right? Because that strips away the, the fear aspects of it because so much of like people around transitioning, you have to choose to step into a world that denies your existence and like, like poses a threat to you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could wipe that away, in your in your heart of hearts, would you, you know, like would you transition if you could? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really sort of like, first answer and if the answer is yes then you can go from there and figure out what what that could look like for you but hmm. yeah. is there a fear like what if i'm wrong like what if i come out and say all this and then i end up changing my mind or you know realizing that i i don't know like it was any of that relevant absolutely yeah um i very much think it's relevant um i would say that when people when people are making that choice Every, everyone has that question, right? You're, you you want to question yourself because it's such a, a, a big decision. But once people do make that choice, there's such a minuscule percentage of people who ever, you know, what they call detransitioning or something mm. like that, that is so incredibly rare. All of the outcomes for trans people when they choose to transition, your, your, your outcomes go up. Your happiness, your overall health, your longevity, all those things go up. So I've never met somebody who, was anything but ecstatic, you know, um, about about choosing to be who they are. Mm -hmm. Like my life got so much better. Like I could I could never go back. I couldn't. It w wouldn't be an option for me. Hmm. It wouldn't be life anymore. I imagine there were probably some nerves to set out on the AT as a trans person. You didn't know how that was going to be received. Mm -hmm. um, before talking about the reception, can you just talk through about like your mindset going into the trail? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I very much had that had that concern. Um, so my first thing was like, I'll go and start Google searching or whatever and find, you know, experiences of other trans people who have done it, things to look out for, stuff like that. And um, there's just so there <clears throat> at that at that point, there was very, very few resources available and very few people who were, uh, you know, trans folks who were telling their story publicly. 
Um, my my friend Aubrey Drake was one of the only names that came up, um, and um, but I don't even think theirs was related specifically to through hiking the article I had seen. So really, there there just wasn't that information, and I had always been a super private person, especially before trans like before transitioning. Like if you look on my Facebook, there's not a lot of pictures. I, I was very careful about pictures of myself. It, it made me uncomfortable. Um, but when I saw that, I was like, okay, you know, I this is an opportunity for me where there's clearly clearly a lack of information and I don't want other people to have an empty search bar or you know empty search results when they um when they look up you know trans through hiker or whatever so that's actually when I you know like applied to be a blogger for the trek and everything in 2021 like so that was my that was a a, a purpose behind my through hike in addition to all the other you know like standard ones that I had was mm -hmm. to to tell a story and to put myself out there so that people don't feel like they're the only one. Yeah. Because it, even even now, even with there are more trans through hikers out there being public, you know. But at the end of the day, if you're not fully plugged into the through, through hiker community, which a lot of first time through hikers aren't, they might not have access to them or might not be able to be able, be able to find them. So like, I don't know. I I just want to be. I wanted to be out there so that people didn't feel like they were alone. Hmm. And walk us through going into the trail with this apprehension and this mission to shine a spotlight on yeah. trans hikers on trail, walk us through those concerns versus like the early days and weeks on trail. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of like the, the very first few days, um, I kind of just kept to myself. I think a lot of people do that. I'm not, I, that's not specific to being trans. Um, I think a lot of people come in pretty nervous um, mm -hmm. on their first through hike and they're doing what they think they're supposed to do and not everyone's not fully gelling yet on trail. So I think that, that's kind of how it went. Um, but I ended up, um, when I got to Franklin, I, I met another queer hiker who's a good friend of mine, Oliver. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, they're non-binary and um, we, you know, formed a really close, a really close relationship. Um, so I think that having like meeting somebody else who was queer and trans, like it just it set my heart on fire. You know, it made me feel really, really um, happy and to be to feel seen. Um, but that being said, you know, like I, I made so many friends early on 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 the AT that were just like so kind and so accepting, and um, you know, like who I you know, within 10 minutes of meeting them, like was comfortable to tell them about my identity and, you know, like share my pronouns, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, th those early days were like, were really formative and I'm lucky that I had, uh, so many positive experiences early on because if I went out there day one and someone started yelling slurs at me, I, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Mm -hmm. Has that happened on trail? Um, I have had a situation <laughs> like that. It wasn't, well, it wasn't from someone on trail. It was um, from somebody who had pulled over to to give me a hitch and and had said some um, some nasty stuff to me, some transphobic stuff. Um, oh, and you know something interesting about that too. This is like okay. People always ask me after the AT. They were just like, "Well, how was the South? Right? Like, how was it? Right? Was it scary?" Um, because I think people have this idea that, that the South is like the more transphobic one, right? Like, and they're not wrong from like a legislative standpoint, all that kind of stuff. Um, but that experience where I, where I was yelled at from the hitch, that, that was in Massachusetts. Wow. That was in my home state, in a, in a town that's supposed to be very progressive. Hmm. Um, and I, I think that it's important to remember that it's so easy to look at the, you know, quote unquote, the South as quote unquote, the problem, right? But at the end of the day, like, transphobia is everywhere, right? Like, there, there are people everywhere who, who you know, um, have hatred towards, towards trans people. And it's, it's almost a way of pushing away responsibility to people in those, like, the quote unquote, good states. Mm by being like, well, hey, you know, we're not, you know, Georgia or Tennessee or whoever it is that they're saying is is um, is so bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a lot of really, really positive experiences in the South. So um, rather than trying to sort of like push off that that um, accountability, right? Let's say like, hey, every state, I don't care what state you're in, you have accountability toward, towards this and towards, um, you know, doing your best to support people and support the, the queer and trans community. One thing we heard from Patricia Cameron, um, founder and executive director at Colorado Black, or just Black Packers, was that 
her experience was the hikers were always very cool and things could get sketchy when she would go into town. Is there any parallels with that in your experience? Um, I, I've never, I've never, I haven't had anything too bad happen from, from another hiker. I've had, I've had experiences happen where I was uncomfortable or it was clear that they were treating me differently as a result of my transness. And I think that is like more where the focus should be anyway, right? Because like, all right, um, you know, is it, is it baseline good that I haven't been beaten up on trail for the, simply for the fact that I'm trans? Yes. But does that mean that we're like doing great and that hikers as a community are, are like, that have nothing to work on? No, no, of course not, right? Mm. Um, so I think there's like, um, it, people are people. It doesn't matter if you're a hiker or someone who lives in, in a trail town or anything like that. At the end of the day, we are all living in this society that has taught us to be, um, you know, to have that like transphobia and stuff, right? Like, you know, we, we do have it inside of ourselves, you know, whether or not we're um, acting out or something like that, our society is built this way. So it's something that we can, that we can all take a look at. I guess that is to say that like they're, everyone, every, everyone has something to work on, I guess is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. I guess let's, let's go with that. You mentioned, you know, you're not getting beat up on trail, which is a pretty low bar to clear. Super like, low bar. Everyone yeah. should have <laughs> that, right? What are the things that you think people get wrong more commonly? Um, well, okay, so I think um, I, I wrote something, it was actually for the Trek, um, Trans Competence on Trail. Um, it was like a year or two ago now. And, um, you know, I, I've looked back on it and they're all really good practical bits, um, bits of advice, right? And there are ways to make sure that you're not um, misgendering people on trail or ways that you can, that, that you can be um, aware of, of that and knowing the right questions to ask, things like that. Um, I almost want to like, my perspective on it's changed a little bit in that I think we even need to take a step back from that. Because for something like, you know, a list of tips for, to be trans competent on trail, like you have to already be on our side and your intent already has to be positive, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you mess up one of the trans competency on trail tips or whatever, it's not the end of the end of the world because what I truly care about is your intent and your willingness to learn and your and your willingness to treat me with respect, just like I treat you with respect. So I almost more like I want to encourage people to try to like to do that self introspection into figuring out what's going on in your heart. What are the things that have like built up all of the um, you know maybe like preconceived notions you have about what uh, what trans people are or like who you know who we are. Um, and how do you sort of like deconstruct all of that so you can get to a place where you're going to be doing your best to, to gender people correctly on trail, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, if you're, if you're listening and you're just, you know, like, and you're doing your best and you want to know the right thing, for sure, read, you know, read the trans competency on, on trail bit. Um, if you're listening and you think um, that, you know, trans people are sick or that there's something wrong with us, maybe start there instead because you're not going to be interested in getting my pronouns right if you don't see my humanity in the first place mm. where do you send someone that has the later views like how do you the latter views i mean like how do you how do you take someone who thinks trans people are sick and there's something wrong with them and get them in the direction of this isn't the case well i mean i think from from my perspective um i think the best that i can do is that when I'm on trail, I interact with people all the time who they've never knowingly met a transgender person before. Mm. And if I can be that first p point of contact for them so that they can get to know me and realize that I'm just like them and that I'm not all the things that they've heard on, on the news or that you know I'm not scary or sick or dangerous or anything like that, um, I think that is, the, that is like where the change can happen. Um, you know, it, I, I, in an ideal world, we wouldn't, you wouldn't need to personally know somebody to see an entire group's humanity, but it is a starting point and I'm willing to meet people where they're at. And, you know, Hey, if me just being like a buddies with you and, and, um, talking to you and you getting to know me or me getting to know you a little bit, if that helps you to, to see me and therefore other trans people as human, then, um, let's, let's go from there. Mm -hmm. 
one of the tips that you offered in that very good piece, um, tip number four, believe people. How often do you run into the situation where you present that you're trans and they're in disbelief? Like they don't believe <laughs> the identity that you have is what you are. Um, you know, it, it's hard to know exactly what's going through someone's head in any given interaction. Um, you know, it, maybe a couple times in my life have I someone out, had someone outright in my face be like, no, 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 that's not right, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but it is, it, it's about changing how like your internal monologue around things. Um, I think that a, like a beginning point would be, you know, if, if somebody com comes out to you, um, you thought that they were say, you know, my people thought that I was a man, but, it, but I'm actually a woman, right? Um, how, how can you work on changing your perspective so that you see that person as a woman and that you're not still translating between, I see this person as a man, but they want me to say that, that they're a woman. Mm -hmm. Right, like how do you how do you make that shift, and how do you change the way that your like that your your eyes and your brain work to see the person as who they really are, and not who society told you they were? Mm -hmm. I, jumping back to the like being a positive first impression for someone, like if you are the first trans person they see, that that conversation just instantly made me think of like when we talk about through hikers going through towns like how like you represent the through hiking community you need to leave a good impression don't take your shoes off in the restaurant like all that stuff you tell hikers and i feel like by the end of trail you see people still starting to do the things that they're like oh i shouldn't like i have to make a good impression but i'm just so tired you know like i just want to leave i, I want to take my shoes off like i don't care at this point it must be exhausting to have to like be that positive perception at all times and like be that ambassador at all times for that community how do you handle always having to be on when it comes to putting on that positive front and how do you like decompress all that and unwind and like you know just unwind unwind yeah that's such a good question um it, you're right it, it can be challenging but I think an important thing to remember is I need them to see me as human and perfection is not human. Um, so I don't, I don't need to be perfect all the time. Um, granted, if, I think more to the point of your question, right? Like if I only have a one fleeting interaction with someone and I'm a total jerk, that's what they're gonna remember about me, right? So I guess there, there, there is that aspect. Um, but I would say that like, you know, even if I'm having a bad day, I, I, I just do the best that I can and I have to have grace with myself and be willing to be like, that didn't go like how I wanted it to, but that's okay. But you know, again, that, like y'all have social interactions all the time too. It's the same exact thing. Do you ever, do you, sometimes you walk away and you're like, I give myself a C on that one, you know? Like, didn't crush <laughs> it. Yeah. Not. <laughs> yeah, didn't crush it, but you know, like th that happens to me too. It's, it's basically that, that same kind of thing. Um, was there a second part to the question? No. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, there was. Um, like how do you unwind? Like how do you, I don't know. I, like I don't even know how to word that question. No, you, but I no, feel like like fine, when we yeah. do our trips, like we have to hype each other up for the social interactions and like being the person that other people are gonna see and like they know us, we don't know them type stuff, and then we get done with it and we're just we both talk about how we're just exhausted. You yeah, know? and it's good that that y'all have each other to do that with, right? And I I think that's kind of my answer too is. Um, you have people who are like safe within your own community, people that you're close with. Um, it doesn't have to be other trans people, but like my be my best friends, they'll get me, you know, calling to like vent about something or to like express like, you know, I feel, I feel like this didn't go that well, right? Like, um, and, but yeah, it's also really, really good to have other people in the trans and queer community because they get it in, in, in such a deep way, right? Like they, they very much feel it and probably have their own examples of how that, how that manifests for them. So um, yeah, I, I call my friends. Um, I you know I have a queer friend in my family, so we're um, uh, their name's Traps. Hey Traps, and uh, yeah, so Tra Traps su supports me too, and we support each other when we have to deal with uh, tough stuff on trail. Because you're such a big presence and you're such a big advocate, I imagine you get people reaching out to you all the time with questions about like maybe they're on the fence about coming out or transitioning or whatever it might be. Do you have like a general piece of advice that you offer to people? This can be the general community or hiker specifically, but mm -hmm. um, I'd be curious to get your take. Yeah. Um so yeah, people people definitely reach out to me, and I'm super glad when they do. So if you're hearing this and you and you have questions or anything, please do um, message me on Instagram. I'm pretty on top of it when I have service. 
Um, and that'll be in the show notes, but it's Selter Skelter. Yeah, Selter Skelter, thank you. And um, I, uh, <laughs> I I like to find out what people's experience have been so far, right? Because like you're not gonna give like one, one size fits all advice to everybody. Um, and then I'd like to make sure that I'm giving them like an accurate, honest representation of what it's like to be on trail and some of the challenges that they'll face. Because if I'm like, oh, it's gonna be rad, like you're not gonna experience a single problem, everything's gonna be fine. You're kind of like setting them up for failure, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, if people have questions about how to deal with things like medication, those are like easy logistical questions that I can work through with people. Um, if I can go through like what your experience, like the actual experience on trail, um, you know, I, I don't think, I think, I think that I lead with the vast majority, I tell them about the vast majority of my experience, which is that through I can change my life. Hmm. And, it, and it's been the most positive factor in my life beyond getting sober and transitioning. Hmm. Um, and I think that it can be that for other people too. Um, I think that I found so much healing in the outdoors as a trans person, and um, I encourage people to find their own way to do that too. Um, for every, it's not through hiking for everybody, right? Like, you know, if I end up talking through with somebody and, um, you know, maybe they, they have a whole bunch of concerns that they just can't really address that, that easily. Well, maybe through hiking is not, not for you right now. Can we come up with another activity? What's something else that makes you feel good in the outdoors? Um, so just trying to find ways to let people connect with like what their actual goal is, not just like, oh, you want to make it to Katahdin, huh? Here's how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. If you had a frequently asked questions page, like if you just like in general, your presence had a FAQ page, what would be if you could pick like two or three of the top questions that would go on that page that you most commonly get, what would those questions be and what are your responses to them generally i mean i think people want to know how how kind of like the, what, what we were talking about before like how do other through hi hikers handle it handle it do you like who do you come out to on trail um you know how do you deal with being in towns um i think the what is the one that i was getting a whole lot um yeah, people people want to know about about violence a lot. They they want to know like what the physical danger to you is. I mean, the answer to that being like, well, although trans people are four times more likely to face violence than their cisgender counterparts, um, that's whether you're on trail or not. So your existence itself, like, it is you know, like you you do face a higher chance of. Um, violence and discrimination and things like that than a cisgender person would um but yeah so people it's just the basic things around physical safety and then um like who do you come out to you know like how when do you come out to them do you how, how quickly do you come out to your family um and then the one that i was thinking of is how often like when you're challenged if somebody is being me like being transphobic towards you um when is it, it's almost like, when is it your responsibility to advocate for yourself and to to respond or to, to push back, mm. right? Like if someone's like repeatedly um, misgendering you or if somebody's using like transphobic, transphobic slurs about you, um, because people, they, they want to make things better. They care about the community. They wanna make the hiking community better. They wanna educate people if they can. Um, but they're scared. I mean, if, if it's you one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you know, like in the backcountry or something, and they start saying a bunch of transphobic slurs, you know, is, it, is now the time to talk about like why their misgendering hurts you? Or is now the time to take care of your physical safety, right? Like you, you need to pick and choose your battles, you know, you know, as a trans person, as an advocate for no matter who you are, right? Like your safety is what's most important. If you are getting hurt, if you're being, you know, if you're having to deal with all of that, that's gonna keep you from being a good advocate, not make you a better one. Mm -hmm. So taking care of yourself, taking care of your friends, that's first and foremost. And then if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you are maybe like, maybe you're with a group where you can pull somebody off to the side and have a conversation with them because they seem receptive, that's great. But like, what about, you don't need to go, you know, like as a trans person, I don't feel like it's my responsibility if there's somebody who is actively being transphobic towards me to have a conversation with them to change their minds you know like my background's in community organizing right so like a lot of the work is changing minds and how do you you know like you generally have three major groups right you have like your people on one side who are they are for you they're your, they're your allies or other queer people 
they support they support what you're saying and they're they under they already understand that. Um, then you have on the far other side you have the people who do not like you, do not respect you, and will not see your humanity and are not interested in having a conversation about it. But I don't care. Like that group on, on that side is not for me to persuade. Is not for me to try to change. Right. The the movement is always in that middle in that middle third. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, of people and that means that maybe they just don't have enough information or maybe they don't have you know like a, a trans person in their life to ask questions to or um, t to show what trans people are like I guess like in, in a human sense um, so those are the people that I'm most interested in engaging with because they're the most you know like open to change or the most most um, flexible in learning and growing uh, just a quick interruption. If you wouldn't mind keeping the mic a little bit more in front of your face. Oops, sorry. sorry. Just <laughs> sorry, make everybody. sure people get the good audio quality from what you're saying. Uh, one of the things that you'd mentioned in a previous answer about when people reach out to you with questions, and this might be too nitty gritty, is you mentioned they're curious about medications. I assume, are you referring to hormones? Yes, yeah. Is that a difficult thing to manage on trail? How does that work? Um, so I can only speak from my experience. Um, I was doing um, I was doing injections before coming on trail, so I was in injecting estrogen once a week. Um, but the logistics of keeping um, like sterile needles and and um, like keeping things in the right temperature and all that seemed like a little bit much for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I switched back to, to using pills. Um, you know, like they're like sublingual pills that I can just dissolve under my tongue instead. Um, there, you know, I don't have to worry about temperature and, you know, it's just a lot easier to deal with. So that's how I've dealt with it. I also know people who have continued to do injections. Um, transmasculine people tend to do injections. So um, if that's you, if you're thinking you want to do injections, hit me up and I will direct you towards people who can tell you how they've done that. If it needs to be temperature controlled, I just imagine hiking through the mid-Atlantic in the summer. That's got to be a logistical challenge, right? Yeah, I guess. I, I don't know enough about, um, you know, testosterone or anything like that to, to talk about how, how they do it. So um, I, I, I probably won't say anything more about that except to say that I know people who do know the answer to these questions. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just like you had said for <coughs> you, like you found the trail hack for you was to switch from the injections to the pills. Are there other modifications that you made going on trail that made hiking easier for you? Hmm. I mean, the medications are the are the sort of like the daily thing. Um, no, I mean, like not not from like a medical standpoint. I mean, of course, like I mean, I feel like there's a whole other topic of like how your presentation and the way that you like carry yourself in the outdoors, what you're wearing, things like that. Hmm. Um, I think that all um, is something that you that you need to think about right um in what way um well if you know you just have to think about like your safety and what you're what you're trying to do when you're when you're presenting yourself um you know like if i wore a whole bunch of baggy clothes and just wore they're all guys clothes or something like that you know like you, you could present yourself a different way in which people would read you would read you differently, right? And you're either opening yourself up to being misgendered or you're opening yourself up towards um, transphobia, right? Like if they if people were super aware that that I was trans or something like that, like mm. wearing if I was wearing like hyper feminine clothes or something like that, that might be what people notice about me. Mm. So I don't know. I, I just think about my gender presentation on trail a decent amount. I mean, y'all are in the studio with me, right? Like. I do things like I, I love having my hair dyed and keep my nails painted and things like that. And those aren't like inherently any one of those isn't an indicator of gender. But um, I try to I try to give people hints so that they so I'm setting them up for success so that, that, so that they get it right. Yeah. When somebody gets it wrong off the bat and you can tell that it's an honest mistake and they correct themselves, are, are you still hurt by that? Or is it the intent? Like you mentioned previously, the intention is what you're after. Yeah. I, I guess, can you walk us through the level of hurt that you experience sure. when somebody's willing to make the change? Yeah. The, the, the intent is what is the most important thing to me. Um, if, you know, you, you said he, oops, sorry, she, right? Like, we are good, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, mistakes happen, it's not a big deal at all. If it kept happening, or if I told you, oh, hey, actually, it's, you know, I use she, her pronouns, and then you started using he, well, then your intent is, is now different than what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, you know, almost to sort of like juxtapose it with, it with this idea is that while I'm not hurt by any one individual instance, I think that there is a weight to being consistently misgendered and misperceived by people who are around you. 
Um, I think um, I've used the term, you ever heard like, you know, death by a thousand cuts? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's kind of what it's, li what it's like. Um, and a lot of times in media, you'll see things like, I mean, you know, check like Fox News or something like that. You'll see somebody gets misgendered at some event and they freak out, right? Or they, they have like a, what seems to be an oversized reaction. But what you don't see is the million times before that, that they've also been misgendered and, and you know, like the, the weight that that adds on onto things. Um, so yeah, um, any one individual instance, especially when the intent is good, like we are good. I'm, I'm just happy that, that you're here to understand. And, and that's, that's what I want to be for people, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I want to be that bridge for people to understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I can't, it would, it would be disingenuous to say that there is no weight to being misgendered in, in society. Yeah. I can't remember what book I was reading, but there was a comparison for like just like people getting angry and people snapping and how it's like, well, you know, if one bad thing happened to you in the morning, like that's just one bad thing. But if you stubbed your foot on your way out the door and then your bag tore on the way down the stairs and then you forgot to bring your keys and you were locked out of your car and like just these little things continue to pile up. If you get to work and someone says something wrong, like you're going to snap, you know, and that's kind of what that reminds me of. If it's not just you get to work and someone says something wrong, it's, well, I stubbed my foot and then I, my bag broke down the stairs and then I locked myself out of my car. Right. And by the time that happens, you're just like barely keeping it together, I feel like. Yeah, and you know, I have those days just like anyone does related to, you know, my transness or not, right? Um, but yeah, that that's definitely something that I have to keep in mind is, um, you know, when you're, when you're feeling a dead, when you're having a bad day, you can feel it. You can feel it in your body. You can feel it in the way that your mind jumps to like the negative thing or whatever, instead of the positive. Um, so I do have to be aware of that when I can be, um, you know, just to try to like recenter myself and remember what I'm doing and that, that people have the best, like that the vast, vast majority of people have the best of intent and want to understand and, um, are, are good people. I believe that. You mentioned that through hiking changed your life, and now you're this prolific backpacker. You've done a lot. You're in the midst of wrapping up your Triple Crown. At what point did you know that this was your thing? <laughs> um, I actually know right when it was. It was uh, I was like six weeks into the AT, I want to say, um, and Oliver and I were talking, and um, we like kind of like started talking about the Arizona Trail, about hiking the Arizona Trail that fall, hmm. and. Um, you know, I just remember feeling like, yeah, like this is my, this is what I'm gonna do. Like, I, it feels right to be out there. Um, yeah, and it was, it was six weeks on trail. Um, yeah, I just remember feeling so comfortable and at home, and like I was where I was supposed to be. And I, I just can't, I can't imagine a better way to spend my life um, than hiking. <laughs> was your enthusiasm for backpacking as strong when you got to Katahdin? Because it's the common thing where people are in love with it out the gate, and then by the time they get to the end of the trail, they're like, I never want to do this again. <laughs> and then two weeks later, they're planning the PCT or whatever it might be. There's like period, it's a roller coaster. Absolutely. Okay, so super fair question. That was not my experience. Um, I went from Katahdin, I went back to Massachusetts, and I... Um, did uh, my first FKT of the Bay Circuit Trail. Mm. Um, I, I just wanted to keep hiking, you know, like I was not done. And then, so I went from the Bay Circuit Trail and then I went up to the Notch Hostel and I did a work for stay there, uh, which is in the White Mountains. Hey, Notch Hostel people. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I went to the Arizona Trail. Like I was just like, I wanted to immerse myself in, in this community. Um, yeah, I, the community is like the most important thing to me. Hmm. Um, the idea of like having sort of like a chosen family and um, I do think that that exists in through hiking. Hmm. I have a question and I hope I word this correctly. So correct me if I don't. When you mention doing the FKT and FKT, yeah. my mind thinks about what's dominating a large part of the media around trans people, which is sports. Mm -hmm. Are you doing women's FKTs or men's FKTs or just an FKT in general? And how do you decide? Yeah, well, I do women's FKTs. I'm a woman, so yeah. I, w I wouldn't qualify to do a men's. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I, I mean, that very much is, was part of my thought process, the, what's going on in the, in the media, right? Like in, in legislation in, you know, tons of different states right now, um, especially related to athletics, right? So yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. Um, I think that 
by doing FKTs, I mean, like, part of my reason for doing it, not only besides challenging myself, is to challenge the community to that discussion. Um, I think it's really easy to look at or more importantly, not look at all the all the things that you hear about in the media about all the different pe- all the different laws that are happening in all the different states that are directly targeted towards trans youth, trans athletes, and trans people in general. And it's easy to sort of look away from that when it seems like it's this big amorphous thing that you don't directly connect to. But I think that it's important to bring this discussion to our community so we do not have the ability to look away. So that we're forced to that we're forced to do that introspection. We're forced to investigate for ourselves, and we're forced to make a choice. Hmm. Um, so by having people, a- you know, like ask a, you know, ask that question, right? It's sort of like, well, I mean, of course I do women's FKTs, mm-hmm. right? Like, and then you know we can have a discussion from there. Yeah. Can you? I hope I don't get like speared online for this, but can you explain <laughs> it to me? Because I, I can see both sides, and I and I hate that almost because I don't want it to be like I'm not understanding, but I can. Mm as a 5'1 person with like a very small build, I could see the different build, different physical attributes side of the conversation. And I want to be able to understand, you know, both sides of it. Mm-hmm. How do you, can you explain that to me in a way where it's like, just make it make more sense for me? Cause I'm not, I'm not either way in terms of like, I totally understand this or I totally understand that. Mm-hmm. I just want to understand it better. Sure. So. Um, a lot of what the the physical aspect comes down to is well i mean at the end of the day the physical aspect isn't super relevant it is it's a women's fkt i am a woman therefore i should be competing in in women's stuff i think the you know like if you want to talk about like hormones and things like that i am my body runs on estrogen just like yours does i don't i don't build muscle any differently than any any traditional like any cisgender woman does um you know my like estrogen counts are higher than, than, and my testosterone levels are lower than most cisgender women, right? Like, so there isn't that, the benefit that people claim that women have, uh, that, that transgender women have in athletics, just isn't really relevant. And I'll, I'll give you a, an example that might sort of describe it for you. Um, so you know when people talk in through hiking, they talk about um, weight loss, right? Like the the pervading wisdom is that men lose tons of weight and that women maybe don't lose as much weight but their like body their body type changes or their sorry their um composition yes thank you body body composition changes right um so i i i run on estrogen my hormones are are estrogen right so like primarily so I don't lose weight when I'm through hiking. I stay the same weight. Hmm. All of the guys in my family have all lost 10 pounds or 15 pounds or whatever, and you know we're like eating similar amounts. So that's just an idea of how, like, from a chemical standpoint, I, from from any sa- standpoint that's relevant to athletics, I'm a, I'm a woman. From every from every standpoint, I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. That does make a lot of sense. Yeah, I don't know anything about the Bay Circuit Trail. Tell me about that. Thanks for asking. So that is like, I, um, I love the Bay Circuit Trail. It's in Massachusetts. It's administered by the AMC. Um, and it's about 230 miles. And it runs like north to south along Massachusetts there um, on the East Coast, um, you know, like around the Beltway of Boston area. Hmm. Um, and it is such a cool trail. There's there's like obviously not a lot of mountains and stuff like that. It's just some hills. and But there's like gorgeous cranberry bogs. There's... Um, yeah, uh, swamps. There's just like everything that you could possibly imagine, um, and it also goes through so many really cool historical spots too. Um, it goes right past uh, Thoreau's cabin on Walden Pond. Um, it goes over the Old North Bridge where history people. It's where the shot heard around the world was the Revolutionary mm-hmm. War. Um, yeah, uh, it goes by Emerson's house, uh, Ralph Waldo, Waldo, Waldo Emerson. Um, yeah, it just it's it's a really unique trail and um it was a trail that kind of got me through the um through the pandemic because it was close to my house so i started i started hiking it in sections mm. and um it was just a really it was a reprieve reprieve for me um, through a lot of that time so then once i got done with the at i had my trail legs i knew i wanted to go back i was like hey i'd always wanted to through hike this thing i bet i could knock it out and um it was sort of like that like fkt was sort of my like love letter to that trail because mm. it's a uh, it was a place that was really important to me. Is that all trail? Like, is there any road walking or route or anything like that? Uh, it's got less road walking than the CDT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, if, not to put you on the spot, but if you could estimate how much of that is single track? Um, I, 
decent amount. I, I don't I don't know the number, but most of it, it's it's pretty good. Hmm. It's pretty good. It definitely holds up. You know, like I'd say it's better than the CDT or the Florida Trail as far as like overall percentage of um, of walk. Like they did a good job of stringing it together. There, and there's a whole lot of state parks there and everything. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's worth through hiking. It mm-hmm. is worth through hiking. Right now, they don't have like the the same infrastructure. Um, like you know, it's not really set up for camping. There's not a lot of campgrounds, stuff like that. You have to go to private camp campgrounds, things like that. Um, but um, so I how think do you make that work? Hike with, it. How do you make that work with an FKT? Because I could imagine if you've got all the time in the world getting the campground thing, do you have to it, or, or reserve it in advance, or can you just show up on the spot? Uh, you, it, it depends campground to campground. Um, you can try to work things out with people who are you know like working at the parks and stuff like that too. So um, you can do it. And if you want to know how, you can you can message me and I'll give you more of the details. Cool. You also mentioned your first FKT. So you, this was multiple FKTs? The, uh, the Bay Circuit Trail was my first. The second was the Daritess one that I did last. Okay, so um, just one on the, and say the second trail? Uh, the White Mountains Daritess one. Tell us about that. Um, okay, so I did that um, after doing the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, that was last September. Um, I went up and I was working at uh, at the Notch um, up in North Woodstock, uh, working through the AT bubble, um, and then I went out and did. So the route is called the Daratisma. Um, it's where you. Um, it's a continuous through hike of the 48 4,000 footers in uh, in New Hampshire in the Whites. Um, so, yeah, this that is the one that uh, Philip. Yeah. Carsey had, had done, right? Yeah, oh, Phil Car, yeah, Phil, yeah. Phil Carsey has done it a whole bunch okay. of times. He's work, he's working on gridding it right now. Um, yeah, yeah, he's he's not hey Phil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, Phil and uh, and another friend, uh, Declan Kylie, they they helped me out with uh, preparing and getting getting routes together and and doing all the planning out for that um, because it takes you sort of like in the backwaters of uh, of the whites to get from you know, the like peak to peak of the 48. So it's a, it's a really, really like interesting, really, really brutal um, course that goes 230 to 240 miles, depending on, uh, on which choices you make along the way. How well the timeline's all over the place. So please uh, bear with us here in this interview. Sure. How well does the PCT prepare you for the White Mountains? Because the PCT, I know Washington obviously has more vert than like the average stretch in the PCT, but the w- whites are much more of an ass kicker than the average part of the PCT. Yeah. Did you get your ass kicked when you went out there from the PCT? Did you feel like you were prepped for that sort of terrain? I mean, I I'd, I'd done a good amount of hiking in, in the whites in general, and I did some in the weeks prior to the attempt while I was working at the Notch. Um, but y- you're you're right, you're you're spot on. Like you know, the the PCT is a gorgeous trail um, that is graded for horses, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the White Mountains, not a single step of that is graded for horses. Um, so yeah, it, it was a it was a it was a huge challenge and. Um, I would love to take another crack at it now too, and uh, and see if I see if I could do better because, uh, yeah, there, no amount of training is going to be enough for the for the sure. the, the amount of sheer amount of vert and um, the terrain is really rugged. What are the best ways to train for something like that? Because that's so, like Hiking you're saying, that's so mountains. different. <laughs> it's so different from the PCT and it being <clears throat> graded for horses that, like, I just how do you even plan how, what kind of mileage you can make or. Well, I mean, I, I was working with, with my friends, Phil and Declan, to sort of plan out what we thought would be reasonable and where we felt like would be decent spots to, to, to call it for the night. Um, but yeah, I mean, there there is no alternative to training. Like, yeah, the White Mountains, are, uh, they're their own thing, and um, they're very challenging. Um, I, think they're, I think they're one of the most um, challenging, you know, uh, mountain ranges in, uh, in the country, for sure. So... Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have an alternative. I mean, a Stairmaster ain't going to cut it, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Follow-up question on that. How do you handle the rules about camping in the alpine zones? Because when we were on the AT, we had an incident where we were hiking past sunset in like, what was almost unsafe at that point because we were coming down from Madison Springs Hut. There was no more room for us to camp there, and we had to get down to Osgood right. before we had somewhere that we were able to LNT camp in you know a spot that was okay if you're doing an fkt i assume you want to push as far as you can until you can't before you stop yep but then you get these situations where it's i either have to go 
I either have to stop here even if I want to go further or I have to go further than I might be able to. How are you navigating those decisions? Yeah, yeah. Um, you do have to consider that for sure. Um, there's enough places like you could camp at a trailhead, right? So I camped at a trailhead a couple nights when I, when I knew it because I knew it could be there. Um, I camped at, uh, I cowboy camped at Carter, Carter Notch Hut um, after the, or before heading up to the Wildcats there. Um, I just ca- cowboy camped on the porch there. Um, so yeah, as if you are scrappy enough, you can find a place. It won't be pretty, but hey, you just need to sleep for five hours and get up and start hiking in the dark. So, what was your time on the Bay Circuit Trail? Uh, it was like six days and something hours. I'm not sure. It wasn't like a. It wasn't a crazy fast time, right? It, you know, I, I was hiking maybe like 35 miles a day or mm. something like that, which isn't insane, especially considering the elevation. I was more doing it just to set a benchmark because I wanted to sort of bring attention to it. So if you live in Massachusetts and you want to through hike the Bay Circuit Trail or you want to do an FKT, hit me up because I would love to see someone beat that time. Yeah. Any specific logistical pieces of advice for somebody that did want to go after the FKT for the Bay Circuit Trail? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it is finding like places to camp and things like that. Um, it's weird because the when you're the Bay Circuit Trail is like in the Boston metro area, and there are plenty of woods and stuff like that. Like I said, it's a really gorgeous trail, but you know, you're gonna be. It's not like when you're hiking through Damascus and everyone's like, "Oh, hey, a through hiker." Mm. They're like, "Who is this bum who like smells really bad?" And you know, like that that whole thing. Like, because people have no concept of what you're doing, so I think that you have to like. You have to know that and then carry yourself a little bit differently like you than you would maybe in like a more standard trail town. Mm. As far as like charging your electronic, you know, yeah, sure. like, you know, paint, paint the picture for yourself. But. Yeah. We're jumping the timeline all over the place. I should have asked this closer to the top, but I'm still curious. Yeah. So AT was your first through hike. Yep. I want to know, like, what was your biggest newbie mistake? On your- the AT? Oh, my God. I, um... I wasn't all that happy with how I handled my shoes at a few points during during the through hike. Um, I generally hike with with Lone Peaks, and um, rather I know now that like you know I have a system where I'll like basically ship myself, ship them to myself ahead or whatever. Um, but at the time, I, I just wasn't as on top of it. I was just sort of counting on there being some sort of gear shop or like waiting it out. But um, instead, I kind of found myself like in Rangely, like taking a pair of shoes that I, I won't name, but that I was very, very unhappy with, and they blew out on me. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, like your shoes are so important. Like if your shoes blow out on you when, when you're in Maine, right? Like, you know, enjoy that like incredibly slow walk back, right? Yeah. Um, so like planning out stuff like um, getting like new shoes is uh yeah can make a big difference. Footwear is a motherfucker. I- I had a pair of, uh, I'll say it, high tech trail runners. And part of the issue was that, that they were not wide and I have very wide feet. And on the second day, the uppers separated from the actual like sole of the shoe. <laughs> and yeah, I had toes sticking out. It was, did the typical thing where you hike in Crocs for a day and a did half. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Was either that or duct tape, you know, yeah, right. the duct tape method. Yeah, yeah. I've still got scar. I'm looking at it right now. I was checking to see if it's still there. I've still got the scar on my foot from the Ozark Highlands Trail switched shoes and the ones I switched to just didn't work but right. once you're out there you can't like you do? do anything about it and mm-hmm. you know you just got a little, nice little memory on you yeah <laughs> if you could go back and relive a three-day stretch of the AT what would you pick and why um man I I really like the mid-Atlantic um I mean, I, I I love the whites. It's hard. It's hard to not pick the whites. But in an effort to not pick the whites, I will say um, I really like the stretch that was um, like through Harper's Ferry, like that whole area. I did the three uh, four state challenge. Mm. Um, that was a really good memory for me. Is um, that when the seed was planted that you're like, oh, I can do this FKT thing? I think so. Actually, I I don't like. I don't remember if it was that was when I like decided firmly that I was gonna do it. But I just know that like I mean. Through hikers, like you know, you get a rush out of crushing big miles. It feels really, really good, and feeling like I that I that I was okay at the end of the day, and that I didn't die even after all that you know, like the fears that you might have before hiking such a big day. Um, I think it was, I found it really empowering, and I was sort of like, I need some more of this. Hmm. Um, the force that's forty two miles. Yeah, it's like forty two or forty three or something like that. Yeah. Less specific to any one trail, but more for any of the hikes you've done. 
Have you ever shit your pants? I have not shit my pants, Uh-oh. and I'm not. So you're not lying. a real through hiker. Not saying? a real through hiker. <laughs> yes, you can cut the interview now. Yeah, so you can leave now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I haven't, and um, I mean that's not to say I haven't had like a billion like incredibly close calls, um, but yeah, I've always gotten gotten that waistband down just in time, y'all. Sorry There's to still say. Still time. Maybe sugar is the secret say. here. Maybe you need to have more candy in your diet to avoid. Right. Hey, I'll yeah. just say I also have not shit my pants. No. Hey, heck yeah. But you've had your shit on you. I've had my shit on me. I've had people watch me shit. I've, there's a lot of variations. <laughs> but I have yeah. not shit my pants. Yeah, good. Um, okay, let's jump timelines mm-hmm. to... Well, so you had an epic 2021. You mentioned the Bay Circuit Trail, and then you did the AZT after that. So yeah. total miles, you did 3,000? Yeah, maybe? like 3,300 maybe. Damn. How did you feel? Because I remember after getting off the AT, I was dead to the world. I needed... Uh, weeks at maybe months off before i felt myself again did you not deal with that at all um i mean i think i took a day or two off i like went went home to see my see my friends but um i you know once i got up to new hampshire i i just wanted to 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 be part of it again Mm -hmm. um yeah i i mean i do remember being like physically like my feet needed some time like off the rocks and all that um but after a couple of days, once the sort of like bone bruises had lit, lightened up a little bit, um, I, I just wanted to get back out there because it was like, there's still so much of the season left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell us about the AZT. Yeah, um, oh God, I love the AZT. I love them so much. Um, it's such a great trail. That I think their trail association does a really good job too. I'm, I was super impressed by them and how much they, they invest in the trail um, and in the community and um, yeah, so big fan of that trail. I, th- I think it's just gorgeous, and I really like doing the. I know that the like Arizona Trail, and I also did the Hey Duke um, this past fall too. Like desert trails, t- like I think it feels like historically they've been done in the spring. Like our people, that's sort of like the Nobo season mm-hmm. or whatever is the spring. I really love the fall, like the desert fall. Um, you know, I, I didn't even find that 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 the water was all that like challenging um, that season. I think maybe it had just been like a big monsoon season or something. I seem to remember that being a wet year because I think that was the same year that Billy, our developer, did the AZT. And mm-hmm. He mentioned that like yeah, the water was very plentiful. Yeah, it just like um, I I, did, I just love the desert so much, and um, I'm I'm more than willing to to deal with water scarcity as a means of um, spending more time out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I think it's just absolutely gorgeous. And I think the trail communities are really special there too. Um, there's lots of like little mining towns. I remember really liking Kearney, Arizona. Um, the people there were really, really nice and supportive. Um, and and they're coming around to the Arizona trail. It's like all, you know, like the, the, the less developed trails, um, like I hiked on the Florida trail this year too, right? Um, the Trail Angel community there and the, the towns, they're all just like so like invigorated with energy to find out more about through hiking and to talk to these like, you know, weird people who keep walking through town. And um, it feels really cool. You know, we're, we're talking about sort of being an ambassador for stuff. Like that's a way that you can do that is if you're hiking, you know, like on a trail that's st- not quite as big as say one of the Triple Crown trails. Mm-hmm. Speaking of desert, let's go to the following year. You jump on the PCT before getting into like the nitty gritty about um, your experience on the PCT. I'm curious to know, did you have any apprehension? You're like, okay, this is how I was received on the AT or the AZT. Did you think that entering into the PCT was a whole different ball game or did you feel like you had a perception for how the hiking community would? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if we're going strictly stereotype, I was like, well, we're, we're in Southern California. So it's like, it's likely, you know, going to be decent. Um, yeah, I, I found I found the PCT trail communities to be to be supportive, like in the same way that I felt like overall the Appalachian Trail was too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not like you know you could be you could be in Los Angeles and someone could still say something transphobic to you, right? Like at the end of the day, it doesn't. You know the you know who they voted for in the presidential election doesn't determine whether or not transphobia exists. Right. Um, but yeah, I I don't remember feeling apprehensive at that point because at that point I already done enough through hiking. I I just you know I've been in Arizona a few months prior to that, and um, I just knew that like I, that I feel like I can trust the people and myself to be okay mm-hmm. um, and to take care of myself when I, when I'm out there. So I didn't have that same fear. What was your hiking family situation like? Because uh going PCT northbound is not too dissimilar from the AT in terms of just like the numbers of people. Mm-hmm. Did you develop a tight knit, tight, 
tight knit community right away or did you start with people that you knew? How did that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I started with my partner at the time and, um, and we were, we hiked pretty much through this year, but we started so early. We, we started like, I, th- I want to say it was like March 19th or something like that. Oh, wow, yeah. So way early, um, hit the Sierra, you know, like I did Whitney in April, right? Like, hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, there just wasn't really that that many people at all. Um, I think it's kind of you know a non-traditional experience on the PCT because it was like a ghost town. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so once we got up to Mammoth, um, basically we headed out there because we had seen that there was like maybe like it was like a thirty-six percent chance of snow one of the days, and we're like, okay, no big deal, right? We go out there, and apparently, I don't know if the weather was wrong or we looked at the wrong thing, but it snowed for four days straight. Whoa. Um, heading north from Mammoth. And it's like, well, people talk about how like last year was a low snow year for the PCT. Well, not in April yeah. and not when it's, you know, not when there's like a foot of fresh powder on the ground. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we, um, we like, we pushed through, pushed through the Sierra from Mammoth up to Sonora and um, yeah, it just snowed the whole time. Hmm. Um, a lot of ice axing, like a lot of ice axe work and um, yeah, a lot of like really challenging traverses. But um, we finally got to Sonora Pass. Oh, and Kennedy Meadows North was still closed because like the the whole road was closed. So we ended up having to walk. We walked 15 miles down like the road there, like away from Kennedy Meadows North. And there's like a military, like a uh, marine training, like for like survivalist training thing there. And we pretty much just like went up and knocked on the t- like the booth, you know, like at the entryway, and we're like, hey. Uh, can you guys give us a ride to town? Um, and they did. They like they had one of the military police officers give us a ride to, uh, I think it's called like Topaz. Like it's like a casino in Nevada or something like that. Cause that was the only place that was open at like 1030 when we got in from the pass. Hmm. Did you start in mid-March because you wanted the untraditional experience or did is that just the permit that was available? So we started in mid, mid-March mid because my original thought process was that um, – you know, I had agreed to hike the PCT with my partner and we, I, on the condition that I also get to hike the CDT that year too, mm. um, you know, not expecting that the snow was going to hold on as long as it did. And, you know, we ran into all these other issues. So we started with the, exp- so we were doing like pretty much thirties through the whole, through the whole desert to try to get there fast. That's why we hit the Sierra so early. Um, but then basically once we got to Sonora, sort of like a gut check and, um, we uh, we made the decision to get off for a couple of weeks, wait for things to melt. I actually went and hiked the section from uh, Crazy Cook to Pie Town uh, on the P- on the CDT hmm. during that time period, um, and then came back and we continued hiking north. So that was like we were really alone. Your original question was about tramley and stuff like that. Um, we did end up with a, with a tramley um, starting as of like Bernie Falls. Um, there was yeah, it ended up being there's six of us total. How was the snow situation after you took a couple of weeks off? Um, okay, <laughs> slightly better. Um, it's still really, really deep uh, post holing. You still had the time you couldn't hike in the afternoons if you didn't want to fall in up to your up to your waist and slush and get stuck there. Hmm. Um, so it was it was slow going. Um, you, yeah, like through until like I remember by like Trinity Alps, it was pretty good. Hmm. Um, it was pretty pretty melted out, but then getting back into Oregon, our tramway got up to Crater Lake and just, there was just a wall of snow was still there. You know, you can see like the heat maps, the snow heat, ma- heat maps or whatever they're called. Um, it, it was just pretty rough from Crater Lake up through Washington. So mm-hmm. we actually got off at Crater Lake and went to the Oregon Coast Trail and hiked for two weeks there, sort of mm-hmm. like vacation hiked on the Oregon <laughs> Coast. I like that your time off is still hiking. Yeah. I know, I know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sick. <laughs> so- that's something that we were talking beforehand about how you know Deadpool and Spielberg from the CDT. They also say hi, by the way. They thought you were already up north. Um, but like one thing we were talking about this weekend, because I hiked on the AT with Deadpool, and then he did the PCT, and now he's on the CDT. And I think we graze over this in a lot of interviews, because it's like when we do so many of these, it becomes common knowledge, in our minds at least. But what came up in that conversation, since I knew him from the AT only, was the difference between the continuous footpath mindset as you move from the AT to the PCT to the CDT, and how even when you know that it's not going to be that way, like the change that, like as you're experiencing it, of how each trail differs in that sense. Now that you have done at least part of all three since you're on the CDT now, can you talk about what it's like in terms of the differences between the trail and what people might not expect. 
Yeah. Um, so we've been having that conversation a lot, like in the lead up to making the decision to flip up to Glacier, which we're, which we're doing soon. Um, because yeah, depending on what your experience is, if you had only hiked the AT and then came over to the CDT and I was like, yeah, we're actually gonna take a, we're gonna take the alt around this and we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna fly to Glacier for a while. It, it would make them like die inside. So, you know, you can tell that some, some people it can be really painful to, to make that decision because it's not what they expected. Um, I think that I'm really grateful that I did have the experience of the PCT and my, my family and the people there were like really good at helping me sort of like open my, open my mind to seeing like, it's not the, you know, purest mentality, like that, that kind of thing is not the be all and end all of through hiking. And you know, the, the more like, uh, People who have through hiked a ton do not tend to have that mindset, right? Like you don't hold on to that. Um, I've found the people that I that I've met, um, but yeah, I think that it also helped that I had done the Hey Duke that fall prior too, because the Hey Duke isn't there's not it's not you know as long as you are walking out there, then you're doing great according to the Hey Duke, right? So I completely detached myself from any sort of red line anyway, right? Like there's just sort of a narrative of like what you could do or here's some options or whatever. Um, and there's no one out there to be like, well, this, this way is harder. So this is the right way. Right. Because like that, that's the sort of mentality that you run into a lot, especially in like weather years like this year. Right. You have people who are like, they, they're, they're really tied to the idea that the struggle is the thing. And I, you know, I'm no stranger to the struggle or of like choosing, choosing hard things. And I, and I've done that through a lot of my career is just, you know, continually choose to do something challenging because, you know, I want to see what I could do, but how do you, how do you, how do you like separate out what your like intent is behind it? Are you doing it because you think you're supposed to, or because you want to, I want to do things because I want to. And I think that it's what I want rather than what I think I'm supposed to want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned people think that the struggle is the thing. People don't get to decide what the thing is for anybody is, uh, other than themselves. Yes, like you right. can just decide what that is for you, but not for any other person. Exactly, and 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 if somebody want, wants that route, I am cheering you on the first to cheer you on, and on, on the first to you know pat your back when you're done and ask to see pictures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, yeah, and and I do make that choice too. But I feel like, you know, I, I was writing about this recently, just how like I, I feel like this is you know, in this trail now, finishing my triple crown, I feel like I have finally gotten to a point of growth where I don't feel like I have to do the hard thing now. Mm. And that opens me up to a lot more choices and a lot more like type one fun. And um, I've been really, really enjoying it. Turns out, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's where I am these days as well. And just a quick interjection. So you mentioned redlining. If someone's not doing the CDT or doesn't have people that they're talking to that are doing the CDT, I feel like you don't hear redlining very often. So yeah. can you just define that if someone's listening, they don't know what it is? Totally, good point. Um, yeah, so um, if you use the Far Out app, which most through hikers do on the Triple Crown trails, um, the map has a red line that indicates where the trail goes over the map. Um, so generally people follow the red line, like on the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail, all there is is red line for the most part. There's, there's small alts here and there on the PCT. Um, so you'd only ever be following the red line, but on the CDT, people talk in colors. Um, they talk in, oh, we're gonna do uh, blue to brown to red to green to whatever. Like you'll hear like a list of color combinations and they're uh, talking about the um, alternate routes that are presented on uh, Far Out Guide's map of the CDT. Now I was talking with Deadpool about like, and we had talked about this with your questions, was the trail <coughs> family on the AT, the trail family on the PCT. Obviously, the CDT is getting more populated. So I was talking with Deadpool about like his experience with the amount of people that are now out on the trail. And he was talking about how it changes because even though there's a lot of people on the CDT, because they're not just doing the red line, you're not always in that bubble. What is that like for what you've been through on the CDT so far? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, I think from a timeline standpoint, we likely are somewhere around like the bubble per se. But, um, or, you know, the bu like one of the bubbles. Um, but yeah, we, there was one point, um, this trail magic place called Camp Oasis um, in New Mexico, where there was like 20 through hikers. And we were all just kind of flabbergasted to see that many people in, in one spot. It was really, really cool, um, but it didn't last long. It was pretty much just that one night because people had, you know, you know, people bunch up when there's trail magic or something like that or town nearby. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely not, we're not used to having a ton of people out there, for sure. 
Has it been hard making a trail family or did you have one going into it? I didn't have one going into it. I actually, like, I was I was crushing miles up front, like doing big mile days early. Um, and I was at Davila Ranch, um, which is like, it's like around, um, like after the Gila, um, heading towards Pie Town. And, uh, and I met the group of people who, who I'm hiking with now. And, um, you know, I don't know, you can just sort of feel it. Like when you, when you meet people and you just click. And um, so I was just like, hey, can I hike with you guys tomorrow? And uh, I slowed down and I've been hiking with them ever since. Hmm. So you're going for the less struggly route now on the CDT. Yeah. But it sounds like you got a good amount of struggle on the PCT. It sounds like you were in snow for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like that took away from your experience, that enhanced the experience? What was your thought process there? Um, for the PCT, you're asking, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think it I – was, I was happy to have that experience when I was having it. I will say, like – you know, and all you PCT people out there this year, much respect because like it, there is a mental component to walking on snow for over a month at a time. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's not a matter of can you, right? Like, because physically it's fine. Your feet are always wet and cold or whatever, but that's fine. If all, hikers all deal with that, right? But it does wear you down to always be having your feet slip underneath you or to always have the potential to be that you fall through a post hole. Um, there is just sort of like, a, you know, your cortisol is up, you know, mm-hmm. like the, the stress level is just slightly higher than it would be if you're just like cruising, you know, like on a sunny, sunny day, like with on a, you know, nice trail, dry trail. Yeah. And moving slowly and carrying more food, like carrying more food. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it's all just sort of a, a weight and added an added, uh, like mental, so psychological, emotional weight. <clears throat> um, I don't want to skip these, but in the interest of time, I, I do want to talk obviously about the CDT. I guess give us the highlights from the Hey Duke and the Florida Trail. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Hey Duke, the two trails. When I when I was watching all those documentaries in my room during the pandemic in 2020, the ones that I wanted to do the most, I had seen this one um, from this person, Alex Mayer. Um, he did one called Figure It Out on the Hey Duke Trail, and I watched that and I was like, that's the trail, like that's the one. Um, that, that I just really aspired to doing that. And then, um, you know, there's a few different CDT ones that I had watched that I, that I was really sort of struck by. And um, I just, uh, those were the two trails that stuck out to me the most. I knew that I didn't have the skills right off the bat to go and take on something like the CDT or Hey Duke, or I didn't feel like I did, especially considering like the orienteering and wayfinding, things like that. Um, so I did all these other trails, but after the, you know, like, basically like once the the PCT was done and especially after the experience I had, I was like, I got this, I can do this now. Mm. Um, so yeah, getting out on the Hey Duke was like a dream come true for me. Um, like the, you know, I, I had such a good experience in Arizona on the Arizona trail. And so getting to sort of explore the back country of all the national parks there in that area of Utah and Arizona. Sorry, I was Googling it. That's <laughs> <laughs> cool. They have a music Didn't on their my, website. <laughs> Didn't know my <laughs> Um, I just really like the, the choose your own adventure aspect of it. And the fact that it's unlike, it's, it's not like a quote unquote, like through hike, right? Like you're not just out there crushing miles, wait until you get to the next town. It's how are you going to work your way through this slot Canyon, right? Or how are you going to get up and around this cliff that you thought you were going to be able to go down, but you can't without climbing gear, mm. right? Like it, it's more, it's problem solving, um, in a very like engaging way. And like, people can probably think of a time when they're through hiking when they were like fully checked in, right? They were, they were coming across a challenge and there's something really exhilarating about going through that and coming out the other side and feeling empowered by that. And that's, that represents a lot of, uh, a lot of the challenges on the Hey Duke for me where like, I wanted, I wanted to, I thought that I could do it. I wanted to know that I could do it. Mm. And um, yeah, so getting, getting to see a lot of the places, like I'd always wanted to see the maze in Canyonlands and I got to do the maze all, which is one of Skirka's alts. And uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, like I did, I did a bunch of skirts, different alts and everything. To, um, it, it just brought me to places that uh, a regular single track won't 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 get you to. What's the most difficult aspect of the Hey Duke? Is there like a certain feature or mm-hmm. element to the route that you found to be the most challenging? Yeah, so the. People call it the the crux of the trail. They say is Saddle Canyon, which is inside Grand Canyon National Park. Um, I was going through November, and um, 
you go up and down the Grand Canyon three times on on the Hay Duke, where the Arizona Trail is just once right right through the corridor, through mm-hmm. like sort of like the main route there. Um, but the Grand Canyon is huge and insane and just so like so gorgeous. So you're just already exhausted from like I had been in maybe seven days in there, like uh, you know, up and down the canyon. Um, but Saddle Canyon, there's like a pretty brutal bushwhack to get into it, and then um, it's a lot of pour offs, like slides that you do into these pools of cold water. Um, since I was doing it in November, um, it had been it was snowing the day that I went through, hmm. uh, sleeting and everything like that. So. Um, you know, it's sleeting, you're sort of like sliding into these plunge pools that they have, like, and then swimming with your pack and everything. Um, and yeah, I, I had a, I had a couple scary moments and one where I, where I thought I was cliff stranded. Um, I was, I had climbed up a cliff to climb past a pour off that I couldn't descend without climbing gear, um, without, without a belay. Um, so I was sort of like scrambling along the side of a cliff and I, and you know, in, in a, in, it was a mistake, right? Like I thought that I had like basically like run out of the, the path that I thought was there wasn't there. Um, so I thought that I was going to have to essentially like sort of like drop my pack down this ledge that I had climbed up that I, but it would have, would not have been possible to climb down. I thought I was gonna have to drop my pack and then fall myself, likely breaking something, hmm. um, and try to protect my head and then try to hit my, my SOS button, which can be tough in a slot Canyon because you not, can't automatically get a signal out. Hmm. Um, but yeah, thankfully, I, you know, I had my I had my bag dangling down the the ledge that I was about to drop, which is essentially committing because once you leave your, you know, once you drop your pack down there, you have to be down there too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had like slid all the way to the very corner, had my bag dangling, and then I looked over, and it was from that angle I hadn't been to that angle before because there was no other reason to other than jumping off of it that I would have. Um, I had seen a, like a path around. Um, it was a very painful path. I ended up getting all bloodied up and everything, but at least I didn't have to fall down like a, you know, 20 foot ledge and break something. Yeah. If you're at the bottom of that with a broken leg and then you see that path, I'm assuming that's a bad day. (laughs) I was, yes, I was ecstatic. I was ecstatic when I saw it for sure. Oh yeah. Um, Zach's just causing a ruckus over here. Okay. Uh, th- Zach was right when he said, you've done too much stuff. This is a you problem. You've done too much stuff. So we're just not <laughs> going to be able to get through all of it. You're going to have to come back um, and we'll do it more in depth part two. Mm-hmm. But I know like there's even questions at the end that we want to get to outside of just like trail resume stuff. I want to do something slightly chaotic that we have not yet done. Can you give us, and this is going to be like a rapid fire, not much thought in it like whatever comes to mind first type of setup like your myspace top eight of just like moments from any of these trail that just come to mind like top <laughs> moments that just come to mind just like just, good just, ones yeah just as fast as you can um i mean i definitely remember harper's ferry um waking up it was like five thirty in the morning um looking out over the town that a train was coming through um it was foggy and all the like all the lanterns were lit and everything. And I remember feeling like, hey, this could be in the 1700s and I, and I wouldn't know. Um, That's a good one. That was a pretty magical one for me. Um, I had a lot of moments um, on the on the Arizona Trail, um, like sunsets that, that I saw. Um, I forget, I think it was called like White Canyon or something like that. Just looking out over all these saguaros and everything. And there's that feeling of relief in the desert, hiking in the desert when the sun finally goes down. And it's like the entire desert takes this collective sigh of relief and things open up and the animals start coming out and moving around and everything. And I just remember feeling really grateful to be a part of that moment in such a beautiful place. Um, on the Bay Circuit Trail, um, I really loved a moment where I was at Walden Pond, um, you know, which is sort of a oft written about and oft, uh, you know, painted spot. Um, and yeah, just seeing the sort of like haze of the, of the morning and that feeling that, that you're up walking and that, um, you know, you're getting to like experience something special, like just for yourself in a place that is shared by so many, so many people every day, but feeling like I was the only person there. And like I had Walden Pond to myself was really special. Um, on the Hayduke, 
Oh my God, there's so many. I really, I had this incredible, I, I'm a cold soaker, so it wasn't, it's not the most delicious dinner you've ever had in your life, but I really like cold soaking. But I remember I was there at sunset for, um, I wanna say it's in Needles, it's called like Park Place or something like that. There's a really gorgeous view um, with a lot of those, what are the what are those things, hoodoos or, yeah, hoodoos. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, just like eating dinner, watching the sunset over all these different hoodoos. Um, that was really magical. Um, Oh, also on the Hey Duke, I spent a day waiting for a hitch across the Colorado River. Um, it was post after raft season, so there's no more commercial rafts coming down. Um, so I ended up just camping out on a beach for an entire day, um, you know, basically waiting to get across the river because there was there, you couldn't continue. It just ran into the river. Um, so spending that day on that beach completely by yourself in, in the Grand Canyon. Um, which, I mean, you can never really be by yourself in the Grand Canyon. There's so much life down there. Like, the Grand Canyon is its own universe, and, and I could spend unlimited time there just exploring because it's impossible to see it all. And y you become so aware of all the people that have spent millennia, that, you know, people have been down there for millennia, and you see the, you know, the, the remnants of that. Um, there's the Nankaweep ruins right there, too, that, that were really beautiful. Um, so you become hyper aware of that you're just this, like, fleck of history when you're in the Grand Canyon. Oh, doing the highlights from each trail? We're doing her MySpace top eight. MySpace top eight. With what no are, context. Oh, you're at five. Is, I'm okay. counting. <laughs> you got three left. So these are best friends from... No, these are just... What's top first, moments? Top, you're like your MySpace top eight. Like you're the top, like you were saying, the French. It's the yeah. eight you pick. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like pick eight moments. I was moments. just trying to understand the... Okay, I Pick get eight okay. moments, any trail, any context. Kay. Just first eight that come cool. to mind. Great yes. We're at five. Okay. So the next one is on the PCT, the last few days. Um, shout out to my family, Julia, Corey, Sam, Mariah, you know, Sugar Mets, <laughs> Lost and Found, and Starburst. Hey, everybody. Um, the Those last few days there, uh, we weren't all together, but the, the six of us who were together, um, we, one of our, our friends, Sam, uh, Sam from the Tramley, he found a baby squirrel and um, he basically picked it up and put it in his uh, pouch um, and ended up getting, you know, it, was, it had been abandoned essentially. Um, so we ended up bringing it with us uh, to the Terminus and it celebrated with us when we did prom. We did like a Terminus prom. We had all carried out um, sort of like prom dresses and stuff like that. So we did a big charcuterie thing and had a big party there. Um, that was really special. And then we, we were able to get, um, to get uh, the squirrel place once we got back to Mazama too in a uh, sanctuary. Holy shit. Uh, <laughs> so nice job, Sam. Um, I think from the, I'll do one from the Daratissima too. Um, I, I talked about this recently. Uh, there have just been some moments like doing an unsupported through hike, uh, an unsupported FKT attempt is incredibly isolating mm -hmm. because you are not allowed to get support. You can't have, you know, like, you never wanted a hug more than when you can't have one. Yeah, logistical or emotional support. Or emotional, that's right. Yeah, emotional support. Um, so yeah, like I, I found that I really deeply connected with, my, with myself at a few moments on trail, but especially when I was about to go over Franconia Ridge, which y'all are familiar with from the AT. Um, it's just like an iconic moment, uh, iconic bit of the trail. But when I was doing it, it was um, just, it was turning dark when I was heading up. And um, it was raining and it was cold and I had already done, you know, 25 or 26 miles in the whites of it fast that day, you know? And um, yeah, like I, I felt really deeply connected with myself and I spent some time connecting with, with my inner child in that moment too, which is something that's important to me. It's, it's, a, it's a good way to get through struggle is finding a way to connect with yourself and to comfort yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really meaningful to me. Like as I pushed into something that I knew was going to be challenging and scary on like a physical level, um, yeah, I, I I found a lot of solace in that, and and I've maintained that connection. Hmm. What am I at? Six. No, you're at seven. You got one left. Hmm. One left. Final what trail one. haven't I talked about yet? I'll do one from. Um, well, you went from the CDT. Um, I really. <laughs> there's so many cool moments. Um, I think the. Heading, well, which one should I do? I really like the, I mean, I like the desert. So I'm, I'm going to do New Mexico because New Mexico never gets its due on the CDT. People love talking smack about New Mexico. But there is, there are some moments there where like you're walking on plateaus, looking out over these wide, sweet, like wide sweeping views that, 
you know, like the Hey Duke can't touch, you know, like there, mm. there are just some moments where it's, they're not, they're not often, but there are these moments where you feel very like ensconced in the rocks and in the, you know, like in all of the, um, all of the rock features and all of the canyons that you're in and everything. Um, there's some really special, like intimate moments that you can have when you're in a canyon by yourself or overlooking the, you know, a big sweeping canyon view by yourself. Um, so a few of those. So if I'm understanding correctly, there's points on the CDT in New Mexico that are more beautiful than the best part of the Hey Duke. Not there, there's some really <laughs> awesome parts. Okay. I'm not going to say that they, that they cannot, that they can't be rivaled, but that's a, that really reminded me of some, of some good points okay. is, is what I should say, because overall for, for beauty, I think that the Hey Duke has been the most beautiful hmm. trail experience that I've had. Hmm. It's interesting because when you're like, great job with the top eight. We've never done that before. Yeah. But with no context of give us stories about this or give us stories about that, really could have gone any direction. It seems like to analyze what you picked, yeah. you're kind of drawn to like the calm, peaceful, tranquil moments on trail. Like that's a majority of what your eight were. Do yeah. you notice that or is that like. <laughs> that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I, I think that for me so much of my life has been chaotic. Um, I like invited chaos into my life for years and years and years. And I, I wouldn't have known how to appreciate peace or calm. It wouldn't have meant anything to me. Hmm. Um, and I think that now when I can actually sit in those moments and feel and feel them and feel that connection to nature, that is when I feel sort of most complete or like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, it's not a feeling that I was afforded very often in my life prior to getting sober and transitioning. So the fact that I really get to sit in it and um, revel in it now, it's clear that's important to me. That's a really good observation. Mm -hmm. Free therapy session from Trance. <laughs> yeah. <thanks John. laughs> I, I have Talk no business that. being a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're on the CDT now. Let's talk a little bit more about the CDT. You just gave us that beautiful illustration of your time in New Mexico. I'm curious to know, I imagine going through the San Juans has been a real motherfucker. Yeah. How does that compare to like being in the Sierra in April? Yeah. So the so heading into the first major section, I did start on the red line with with one other hiker, um, and we went through. Uh, we hiked a few miles past this place called Blue Lake. Um, I want to say it's like third, like thirty, thirty-five miles in or so um, to like the main section um, after Chama. And yeah, we came across some pretty rough traverses where it's clear that other people had dropped down before the traverse and hiked through the valley, mm. but we continued across the traverse, um, which, you know, you end up just sort of like, we were cutting in steps and, you know, using the spike on the ice ax to give yourself a, a solid handhold. And um, yeah, I mean, it's exhilarating, but damn, 10 minutes of that is exhausting. It takes everything from your body to, to hold on and to coordinate all those movements in a way that's safe. Um, we, we had micro spikes and everything. Um, so yeah, af after that, we did, had a couple couple like traverses like that. And at that point we decided, okay, we're gonna drop down. We ended up sort of like uh, glissading or is it glissi glissading? Glissading, yeah. Yeah, glissading, glissading down and um, just sort of self-resting with our axes, jumping tree well to tree well mm. to get down back into the, the river valley, at which point we sort of followed the river to get around. And turns out that's what the vast majority of people ended up doing. Um, but yeah, so from there, I jumped back over to like the green line. I met up with the rest of my family, the ones who I'm hiking with now. And um, we sort of like picked a, a series of alts that would me mean that I didn't have to go across traverses again and again. Um, and, you know, like I said, mad respect to all the people who, who did who did continue to push through, push through there. Um, it definitely would have taken some technical skills and it's really impressive the people who did. So um, yeah, good for them. Getting in the valley, is that about the point where you made the decision you're like, I gotta find a different way to d tackle this trail. Yeah, there's like literally, there's like a picture of me where I'm just like pointing at it. I'm like, we did this. I don't know why, but we did, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I wanted to see. I, I wanted, I wanted to try it out or everything. But like, could I have physically continued to go and could I have continued to do that? Yes. But did I want to? No. Um, and rather than do something, you know, for the cred or whatever, um, I decided not to. And um, that's meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and it's interesting because I, I keep saying this, um, I'm sure it's probably annoying at this point, but just hosted the two hikers that are also doing the CDT and flipping north to Glacier. Mm -hmm. And 
planning when they were going to come stop by was funny because at first they didn't know if they were going to flip or if they were going to keep going in. They spent a week out of town, like trying to figure stuff out. Then they went in a bit. Then they ended up coming up. And I feel like now, and it's only been like two weeks, but I feel like now everyone is going up to Glacier. So what, what is it that people are hitting? Is it that because everyone else is doing it, it makes it easier for you to do it too? Or is it a specific spot on trail where everyone's just like, whoa, no, no, no. But where are people going from that I'm going to keep going mindset to I'm going to sit for a few days and think about it to now I'm flipping the glacier? Yeah, I, that's, that's such a good like psychology of a through hiker question um, that I think every through hiker would answer differently. You're like everyone out there right now. I'd, I'd say that like the main things for me were that I had seen the like snow towel or like the, the snow radar things that you see. And um, it was pretty much like, you know, I'm flipping from around Leadville or so. So like right around then is where the snow seemed to really pick up and really like, you know, be expansive and take over. So, um, you know, and it had already been like there's miles of post holing prior to that, too. So you're like, OK, do I want to opt into the next two weeks being full of, of post holing and waking up at, you know, 4 a.m. to, you know, get the early hiking hours in before you start like, dropping into the snow every other step? Um, so I think that was the, the main thing um, for me. But I think there's definitely something to the idea that like once somebody does it, it's easier to be like, oh, that does make sense, right? Or it's easier to, to sign up to something because, you know, like you're, you're always at least trying, you know, contending with your own sort of like understanding of what you want your through hike to be like and what's possible and what's not possible and what level of challenge do you want to have. Um, but I, yeah, I think that once there's like a critical mass, it does make it easier for, for people to make that choice. So, I mean, I've, you know, talk about a poll, throw that poll out there and ask them why they did it. You know, if they're answering honestly, I'd be really interested to see the answers. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of, have you ever seen the movie Divergent? Uh, yeah, that, that, that was like a book series, right? Yeah, you know yes, when she like yeah. jumps, like she makes her faction, she jumps into like the, it looks like just a black hole and she lands on that net and yes. they're like, oh, like, oh, there's the first jumper. And then yeah. everyone else does it. I feel like the first people to flip are kind of giving the others permission like it's okay you know like it's gonna be okay you could do it other people have it's not that big of a deal dude i want to jump out of that train into that hole so bad (laughs) that seems so cool i mean that's a cool moment right (laughs) somebody make that happen y'all i'm I'm clueless over here i haven't seen that so okay so you're wrapping up the triple crown what will it mean for you when you finish (sighs) i um I think that each of these, you know, I'd say, for, so it's like my third year of doing lots of through hiking, full-time through hiking, let's say, like um, the majority of the year. Um, I think each year has been something different to me and meant something different to me. Um, the, like the first year was sort of like a celebrate, like my, that my AT and all that, that first year was like a celebration of everything I'd just gone through with getting sober and, and, you know, beginning my transition and everything and, and feeling like I had been stabilized and I wanted to celebrate who I was and celebrate my, myself physically and my, my own capabilities that I now had. And, um, the second year was a lot more of like pushing myself physically and seeing, seeing what I, seeing what I could do. Um, the Hey Duke was a lot about pushing myself from like a psychological standpoint because you're alone for, you know, I, I, it took me 39 days. So I was alone mm-hmm. for 39 days, um, except for my, my partner came out for, for a day to visit me like in a town. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to push myself that year and just see what I could do. And then this year, you know, it's sort of like, it's like, se- like I'm like, you know, in my head, it's like the, the senior of being a t- of the Triple Crown, right? It's like mm-hmm. your last year of the Triple Crown. So what happened the senior year? You relax a little bit, like. Oh, you're gonna say prank. Uh, <laughs> I'll work on some pranks. You guys can give me some ideas. But yeah, I mean, I think that um, I'm I'm like confident in who I am now as a through hiker and as a hiker and in my role in this community, like in this community. So if I am able to, it, I'm finding new ways to enjoy the trail, and I'm finding new ways to enjoy people's company. The idea, like you know of, you know, quote unquote, slowing down or whatever that means, or like changing your plans to hike with somebody was a challenge for me on the PCT this year. But this, you know, like, you know, making a decision to not just speed ahead because that's, you know, like was so ingrained in me. This year I found cool people that I wanted to hike with and I was like, cool, I'm gonna do this for a while. 
and then knowing in the back of my head, like, you know, of course, like if I, if I want to go off and do my own thing, I absolutely can, but it's really cool to like, um, to feel settled in, um, and to sort of know who I am as a through hiker and know that it's never any one specific thing. I don't always have to be going for an FKT. I also don't always have to be like double zeroing in town, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you can pick and you can pick and choose who you want to be and how you want to approach various situations on an individual basis rather than like, this is who I am and this doesn't change. Hmm. Let's talk gear a little bit. I know you've got a couple of sponsors, so yeah. let's start off with the shout outs there. I see that uh, the pack is one of them. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Deuter is, um, you know, they've been sponsoring me for a couple of years. Um, I really, really like appreciate their support considering like, you know, there's not a ton of trans athletes and, and almost no, uh, you know, trans hikers who are sponsored. So they're, you know, like them stepping up, um, last year to, to sponsor was a huge thing for me. Um, and they like, they completely, you know, support everything I do. I also, I love their pack. Um, what is, is the, the pack? What's the model? This is the Deuter Ultra. It's okay. a 45. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a lightweight pack, but um, you know, I feel like Deuter's more known for their like sort of traditional packs. That's mm -hmm. the space they've been in. Um, but the Ultra is like a really good mix of both, which like I was kind of somebody who came off of like a, like a cottage backpack kind of situation um, prior to that. But like the reality is like on the CDT, you're doing like six day food carries and potentially four to, you know, four to six liters of water. Do you want something with no hip belt? Like a 35 liter with no hip belt? It doesn't matter how small your kit is. If you have to carry a lot of food and a lot of water, something, you know, with a little bit more support is going to be good. So, I mean, the ultra has been awesome for me on trail. I imagine that has a frame, internal frame. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's got like a pretty, it's a lightweight internal frame though. Yeah. Um, and it's got load lifters, which is huge for those long, long food carries and water carries. So yeah, big ups to them. Um, and yeah, and then this year, uh, Columbia is um, like partnering with me on this hike. Um, so I've been using their shirt and shorts and um, hat and they give me some like some rain pants to get through all the snow and everything too, which is awesome. Um, they have like super high quality stuff. I haven't had a single problem with that yet. It's uh, held up really well and I like the way it looks. Um, so I like them. Oh, and then the, um, I'm using a Z Z-Pax, the Soloplex. Mm. Um, so big shout out to them too. Um, it's really nice to, I currently have two trekking poles, but I'm actually gonna be getting rid of the other one. Um, through New Mexico, I was only carrying one. I only got this to go through the San Juans. Mm. Um, so it's nice to only have to carry one pole to uh, for the tent. It's super lightweight, dries out super quick, which you have to do every day on the CDT. Um, so I really, really like the Soloplex. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, I mean, like I've been doing some work with uh, Sawyer for a little bit too. And um, I, I've just always used Sawyer. They've always been like my filter of choice and everything. And uh, yeah, I've never had a breakdown or anything with them. So thanks to them. Um, so what those, about, are, those are the sponsors. What, what about I, quilt or sleeping bag? We'll yeah, so I use an enlightened equipment, the Revelation 10 mm -hmm. degree. Um, yeah, it's funny because people are always talking about like the the rate, like the temperature rating and everything. Like, I just go with a ten degree now because I guess I'm kind of a colder sleeper or whatever. Um, I use a, an eighth inch thin light, the Gossamer gear for uh, for a sleep pad, so that doesn't retain as much heat either. Um, I just go with the ten because that way I don't have to think about whether I'm gonna be cold or not. I'm the same way. I, I sleep really cold, and I feel like even if I'm going somewhere that I know is gonna be warm. As like the ten degree is still like me giving a bit like all right I'm not gonna take the zero degree I'll take the ten mm -hmm. but like the, there's like a cold sleeper fear of yeah. being cold yeah because then if I'm if I'm cold I don't sleep I wake up all the time and then you know I just end up being like up at three and then I can't go back to sleep because I'm too cold or shivering or whatever so ten degree yep. It's nice to remove the anxiety of being like, am I going to be cold tonight too? Like just settling your mind before passing out, I feel like is a reassuring feeling. Yeah. I, would, I mean, I'd rather wake up sweating if I had to, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm the like stick of a stick a leg out kind of gal. Mm -hmm. you know? What sort of parting message do you want to leave us with for the listeners of Backpacker Radio? Anything that we haven't touched on the interview that um, you'd like to leave the listeners with? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so um, I, I want to be a resource for people um, because I think that it can be really challenging to get a foot in the door or to put yourself out there. There's just so many different concerns that come up, so many like legitimate concerns. Um, so if you are like a, you know a queer or trans person and you're looking to 
you know, start telling your story or sharing yourself, sharing yourself publicly. I know that it's really scary. Um, and I know that there's concerns, but I, I think that we need more queer and trans people who are willing to talk publicly about their experience. And that's not so that you that you get sick of hearing, you know, like how scary it is to be trans on trail or whatever. That's that's really not the point. Like the, the point is so that people in the outdoors can get used to seeing queer and trans people so that we are an inherent part of the community and seen as part of the community. Um, there's, you know, like I told you, I'm from like a community organizing background. So, you know, like during election years when you see political yard signs and stuff like that, you see them around town. You know, you'll see your like national commercials or whatever for candidates, but you don't even really think all that much about it. But at the end of the day, when if you're driving around town and you see a billion signs for one candidate and another sign for another, you are more likely to vote for the candidate that's got the billion, the billion signs up, mm. right? Like that, that's just you, like that's science, right? That, that, that's, that's how humans work. <laughs> Right, so how do we do that within the outdoor community? Rather than having it just be something that's like a part of the national discourse, how do we bring it within our community and we say, hey, we are supporting queer and trans through hikers. Here are all these people who are, who are telling our stories who you, can now, who you can now like follow or get to know or learn to understand them differently or ask them questions, right? Like it, it's not just me out here. There are tons of queer and trans through hikers and big shout to all of you. I actually, I mean, can I tell you a couple of people? Yeah, sure. please. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I, so I actually checked with a couple of people in advance because like I wouldn't just, you know, you can't just say people's names because if they don't want it, there is like transphobic backlash. So you do have to consider that. Um, but yeah, so I already mentioned Aubrey, Dr Aubrey Drake, mm -hmm. uh, their gender queer hiker on Instagram. They have a ton of FKTs. They just sent another one up in the Prezies and uh, in the White Mountains. Uh, Stephanie Colley, um, she's also up in the White Mountains um, and always hiking. Oliver Henderson's my partner from the AT and AZT. Um, their fool's card on uh, Instagram. Oh, Stephanie is trans -zen hiker, NH Steph. Um, yeah, Oliver Henderson, uh, they're hiking the Collegiate Loop this year. And um, then my family member, uh, Jordan Penicky, um, they are a non-binary hiker who hiked the PCT last year and is hiking the CDT with me this year. And their Instagram is through Hiker Trash. And we'll make it easy for people. All that will be in the show mm -hmm. notes. Thank you for sharing that. Good call. And then I want to, I know you gave us some suggested topics. I think we went through a bunch of them throughout the interview, but there was a quote that I thought was great at the end of this that I, I'm just going to read it back to you. Mm -hmm. It was a quote from you. And then if you want to comment on it, but I thought it was a good one, which sure. is homework for listeners. Think about all the portrayals of trans people you've seen throughout your life. Think media, news. How do those match up with trans people in your personal life? Take the time to find more accurate and complete portrayals of trans people. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for reading that. Um, I, it goes back to a lot of what we've been talking about, right? Where we could we can talk about grammatical choices and we can talk about ways that you can be more supportive by changing your language and those are all relevant but those are all things that are out there and that you can google and you can figure out what's most important is that you're able to look inside and to dissect what's going on in your heart and how you're thinking about these people why are the reasons what what is your crocodile dundee 2 moment mm -hmm. right that made that made you like that cemented something that you think or a stereotype that you might have about people. It's okay to look at yourself and, and say, oh, hey, like, that's kind of messed up. I think I want to change that about myself. What's not okay is to not ever examine those things and to con continue causing harm because I know that so many people do want to be part of the solution. So, you know, let's look at, let's look at the gram grammatical stuff. Let's make sure that we're getting people's pronouns right. But how can we make sure that we're seeing everyone's humanity? And, you know, how can we make sure that we're getting a full idea of like actually knowing trans people and uh yeah like feeling like we're all equal parts of the community beautifully said this has been a ton of fun thank you for sharing your story um you're a great ambassador for the trail has there been anyone how many people have done more miles than you in the last two and a half years <laughs> i'm sure someone has all yeah. those have you tallied here. your miles over that time span um i haven't i, I think i'm probably in like the the eight or nine K at this point, so it'll be over 10 by the end of the CDT for sure. Yeah. Well, you're prolific. We really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on Backpacker Radio. Yeah, thanks for having me. All. It's been super fun. Yay. To the Trek propaganda portion of today's show, I'm going to be very brief with the description of this one because full disclosure, I haven't read it. It came out today. 
mm. and I just haven't had a chance. It's been a busy day. Uh, but very interested to read this one and contrast it with my own experience because I've done this quite a number of times. The title is How to Score a Walk-Up Backpacking Permit Anywhere. This is by a longtime Trek contributor, Katie Comer. And again, I won't go into it because I haven't read it, but uh, Katie does excellent work, and I know she's got a lot of experience adventuring everywhere and doing stuff like this, so I'm sure this is an awesome article. We'll leave it at that. Okay, so we're going a little bit out of order here. Yeah, good I job want, with that. Yeah, I wanted to kick the question of the day to the segments portion just to keep things more backpacking focused out the jump. So today's question of the day, you want to take it? Um, yes. If you woke up tomorrow morning a billionaire, what's the most extravagantly lavish thing you'd waste some money on? <clears throat> Do you have your answer? Um, I really want to read the comment that prompted this. Yeah, do it. This was a, it looks like Reddit. I, I don't go on Reddit, so I'm sure I found it somewhere else on the internet, but this was the funniest, funniest thing I read. Um, this person had said, I'd go to generic restaurants, give my waiter waitress a hundred dollars to send a glass of milk with ice in it to a specific table. The hundred dollars would be to keep quiet about who sent the milk. I would do this several more times to the same table until they got visibly upset. No waiter in their world would stop sending ice milks, especially after I raised the offer to $500. If I were a waiter, I would gladly keep putting glasses of milk with ice on someone's table, even if they were screaming in my face if I made 500 bucks each time. So yeah, I would do ice milk, instant classic. That's genius. Yeah. That is pure joy. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that necessarily fits my description of extravagantly lavish. Kind of more just like atypical and fucked up, but it's funny. I mean, I think maybe the the money amount, yeah. but I would, I know exactly what I do. I'd hire a lady sitter. Um, a lady sitter. Yes. They talk about this on one of the housewives and I don't remember the context it was in, but it's basically a babysitter for an adult, hmm. um, a lady sitter. So someone to call the dentist and schedule my appointment, uh, someone to make my doctor's appointments, someone to wake like me a personal up assistant. in the morning. No, but like, I want to be woken up. I want like... I want my breakfast made. Are I they want... are they or are they not peeing on your face to wake you up? No, this okay. is a lady sitter. I'm okay. paying good money for this. Okay. They're not paying me. Um, and I would like, I don't know, basically like I would like to be a child with no responsibilities as an adult. Mm -hmm. You know, like how your parents usually do everything for you yeah. when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. I think that would just be like, there goes half my stress. I think you hit on the thing. Once you get that much money, you're just living your childhood fantasies. And if I'm answering from that standpoint, I would buy a majority stake in whatever sports franchise I could get with the amount of money that I have. Like, I would like for that to be either a basketball or an NFL team, but I don't think a bill will get you there anymore. You think if it's a billionaire, you only get one billion? I don't know. Is it infinite money? If it's infinite, know. then yeah, I'm buying the Chicago Bulls, I guess. I but guess it's weird that you wouldn't have enough still. Yeah. Um, Michael Jordan is selling his majority stake in the Bobcats now, I think, for $3 billion, and he bought yeah, it like wild. seven years ago for $200 million or something along those lines. See, I don't need anything like that. I just think like my, like my biggest accomplishment, and I have been patting myself on the back for this all week, like more than I, like I've been giving myself more credit than I even should be, but I updated my registration on my car before I got a ticket. And like <laughs> the the idea that I did it before I got five tickets is huge because last year, parents close your ears. My parents specifically, other parents in general can leave their ears open. I had so many tickets before I did it. Mm. I just couldn't bring myself to do the task. It yeah. was just getting a task done. I didn't want to do it. Um, did you get a boot? I forget. There's something. Yeah, I did get a boot at a point when the tickets clearly mm. weren't making the effect desired yeah uh that wasn't fun it reminds me of the scene from liar liar where he gets pulled over he's like yeah. he goes through all the things that he did to break the law he's like is that it he goes i also have unpaid parking tickets and he hits the glove box and just like a thousand tickets come flying out we could maybe put that in a patreon because we have to edit that out uh, no 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 i mean like we could open my glove box oh on patreon. you got some stuff in there all those tickets yeah you haven't paid them still <laughs> i paid some <laughs> i mean like what are they gonna do it's just i think they tickets. can do some stuff they like the boot could. like the boot is one of those things i mean you'd think they'd have done that by now yeah i don't know like just being a responsible adult has been very difficult for me to accept yeah i don't know why You're i just getting there. don't like Every, you it. went to the dentist today and Look i and i did my registration before i got a ticket that was huge yeah so i think a lady sitter is 
definitely what I would spend my yeah. billion on. Yeah. Yeah, I d I'll play like Madden or NBA 2K and just do like the franchise mode where like you don't even play the game. You just make all the owner's decisions. So to do that in real life would legitimately be not even childhood dream. This is my current daydream. Right. Well, you seem like a well-adjusted adult, so we have different priorities. Appearances can be deceiving. That was fun. I do have a stupidest thing of the week. Do you have anything? Yes. I told you mine already, so I spoiled it. I left my water bottle at the dentist mm. and I got home and I was working and I was thirsty and I thought to myself... Should I put water from the Brita in the fridge into a glass and satisfy the fact that I'm thirsty, or should I wait four hours until I'm back in my car so that I can drink from my water bottle? Again, not a well-adjusted adult. I chose to wait, and I got in my car, and the water bottle wasn't there, and then I realized it was still at the dentist, and I drove 20 minutes here in immense thirst, got in here, and chugged half a water bottle. All of that could have been avoided if I just put water in a glass yeah most days it's like 6 p.m before i realize the only liquid i've consumed is coffee mm -hmm. so i'll just chug water until the point where like that's not the way you hydrate yourself so maybe that's my stupid thing of every week um but my actual answer here <clears throat> is i know i'm getting old because i almost fell for one of those facebook scams no yeah did you almost repost something that was like repost this no, so that they don't share all your photos it's one of those things where you click a link and then sign into a fake page oh no because this was a really you elaborate have a lot on the line here i know you it, can't lose the track that's to that, scammers. that's what got me is because i got a um, a Facebook message. It was like meta support and it had the blue oh, check mark thing. And it was like, you have a copyright violation. If you don't protest this in the next seven days, we're deleting your page. And like, it was presented real enough that I had a minor heart attack. Are you <clears throat> sure you should be saying this on the podcast? Like letting people know that you're like that close on the verge of getting fooled? I think the fact that uh, it buzzed my tower, it whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I mm -hmm. Now my guard is up more, so I don't think I'm as likely to fall for it. But yeah, please. Knock on wood. Yeah. I, I get so many scams all the time, but I can usually spot them out instantly. I like my uh, Twitter DMs are actually pretty funny. Oh, hold on a second. New segment, Zach's DMs. It's just seven messages in a row from a young Asian woman, all different people. Hey, this one's a stock analyst. Yeah. And if you also trade stocks, I am. So I'm getting the same scam just about every Wait, single Wait, these day. are all about stock trading. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so usually they're pretty obvious, but this Facebook one was pretty sophisticated. You almost got me, guys, but it didn't. It didn't. Okay, So wow. almost stupid thing, I don't know, but um, I was very close. I'm like, I'm two steps away from being the person that's sending like outrageous email forwards, like I just want to be the grandfather. Like, the best part about this, if you did lose access to the trek and everything because you fell for one of these, I would just want to see the look on the person's face when they see what you made your password. Because as someone who knows some of your passwords, you got some funny things going through your brain. For the uh, important accounts, I always just use the password generators. There's, there's no, they're just, it's very cryptic. There's no, there's no words. Do you think or, that's giving away too much? No. They're like, <laughs> they're like technically unhackable. By the end of this, your stupidest thing of the week is going to be revealing that you my passwords. revealed your yeah. entire mindset around So my mother's main name passwords. and the last four <laughs> digits of my social are. And your high school mascot. <coughs> right. Yeah. So almost got me, guys. Okay. Get fucked. <clears throat> Uh, today's Triple Crown is, this is one that struck me a couple days ago, and this was inspired by a particular event. This is the Triple Crown, what, how did I phrase it exactly? Triple Crown of Failed Candle Sense. Yes. Well, uh, you can participate if you'd like. Um, so the Triple Crown is we take the top three of a given category. This category is Failed Candle Sense. Um, I have a feeling Chance is going to be using actual real candle scents, and mine are all makeup bullshit, but... Okay. Well, don't underestimate me too much because just because it's a real candle scent doesn't mean it's not wild. Um, this is one. Should we include these links in the show notes? What links? To the candles. Oh, mine don't have links. Like I said, these are made up. Okay. But yeah, you can. Um, there's a company called... The Something to buy your biggest enemy? I mean, I'll, I'll just call it the company name. That'll be enough to find it. There's a company called The Candle Daddy. And they have a scent called Shart. And the photo is a man... <laughs> In jeans, is this your first pick? Holding his ass. Yeah. Yes, I would not want to smell that under any circumstance. So and whoever buys that is fucking sick. Yeah. Yeah, some of the gag gifts are, uh, well, what's that place that's in every mall? Spen Yankee. Spencer's Gifts. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're talking about Yankee Candles. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so my first pick, the one that inspired this, this, this very cliche, but I was reminded of it because my dog's been spending a lot of time in creeks, is wet dog. Mm. Nobody's buying a candle of the wet dog smell. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though I love my dog to death, like, I, I don't even, I find her farts to be less offensive than just her body being wet. I don't even like looking at some of these photos. I don't want to see these. Yeah. Um, yeah, wet dog you, is a good one. Do you have any scents that get under your skin? I mean... I found a pretty rank pair of uh, socks at the bottom of my pack that I forgot about pretty recently. That's a good one. Neglected socks. Neglected socks. Yeah, Even Merino. The, the pack after yeah. a rainy section. Yeah. Actually, stirs a memory of a good one for me. Uh, so Triple Crown, we do a snake draft. If you've got two, you get two in a row. Yeah, we put you on the spot here so you don't have to do it. Um, I mean, I, I just like, I always hate the ones when they do, they do it like because it's like a a holiday or whatever you know like if you're making a thanksgiving one that smells like turkey or whatever i'm not trying to smell turkey in the first place yeah. man like you, i will eat it that one day and then that is it yeah but don't anything that's about a, a holiday in general if it's not like christmas and it doesn't smell like pine trees miss me with it sure i'm garrett hates the like food scented ones i'm all about I, like, like apple I, pie, like apple pie, like pumpkin I guess, pie yeah. is great. What sugar, about chocolate? sugar cookie, chocolate. No, thank you. Mm. Um, but like the like the I'm opposite of you with the warm fuzzy holiday scents with the foods. I'm lighting that mm. everywhere <laughs> in my house. My Mashed second pick. <laughs> See, that's different. My second pick, and this is I feel conflicted on this because I enjoy being here. But if we're being honest, my second pick is the ocean. I was going to go with one of those. Yeah. I don't like those. Yeah. It's, and not all oceans are created equally. Like you can go to the Caribbean where there's less floating seaweed and uh, just the smell of like fish in the harbor. But uh, yeah, that I'm thinking of a very oceany ocean. And I like being at oceans, but like if I could just isolate the smell, fuck that. See, I like, I also feel like I'm doing something wrong by not liking those scents because I feel like the people that like the ocean type of scents are very put together like they mm. all like they're the people that like f- like f- more frequently than most wash their sheets <laughs> like they never <laughs> have dirty correlation. dishes <laughs> in the sink like these are the people that are very put together they've got like a like a nice homey aesthetic that like all color coordinates the people that like ocean candles I would say are like they are neat organized tidy is ocean people. candle a thing? Yeah, there's like the, like the waves sense. on it. Yeah, I mm. think so. Like okay. so there's it's like summer breeze or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe this is like a thing you notice more as a girl, but like it's the same type of people. This is categorized as the same type of people that like the clean linens scent candle. Yeah. So Jenna's favorite scent in the world is clean laundry, which is weird. Like she, if we walk by a house that is currently doing like the fumes of the laundry are coming by, she like takes an extra deep inhale. And she's like, oh, that's so good. It's and I'm so looking weird. at Yankee Candle has black sand beach and it's literally a black candle. Um, I just looking at that, I wouldn't want to open it up and smell it. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming that they're not taking the worst elements of the ocean, but if they are good gag gift, at least yeah. for me. Okay, my next one. Oh, I found one for you. It's called Chocolate Advent Calendar. That's, that's the worst. <laughs> that's of the name both. of the candle. Yeah, it never like chocolate, like chocolate Advent though. Calendar. That's funny. Um. Okay. Is it, it is. It looks like poo in a glass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We should just buy a bunch of those and put backpacker radio labels on them. This is. Uh, see, I'm not going to use this one because it's too similar to my last one. But the reason I had to go to Yankee Candle is I was originally on Google Images. And there was one called Plumber's Ass, and it was just like a, <laughs> it was like an old butt, and I didn't like it, so I had to go away. Um, I love the intro in Happy Gilmore where he's going through all of his jobs, and it's just him like humping things, <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, and then I was also a plumber, and his whole ass is hanging out. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna go with like the scents that are they're strong and like not in any specific like fruity naturey like well maybe naturey but like patchouli like Mm. those types of hippie candles strong candles well even like i feel like there's like tobacco scents or like like ones that are like supposed to be nostalgic smells Mm -hmm. and i feel like it just makes the air smell thick Mm. okay i don't like those ones 
Um, you get two. Did you take two? No, I took one. I know I'm doing a lot of talking for someone who's not choosing. Yeah, less things. talking. We're choosing. Shut up, John's common theme. Um, I'm scrolling through the candles right now. A lot go of them are off peachy. The, go with one off the top of your. There's a certain food one I really don't like, and I can't remember what it is, which is a problem. Mm. But there's one that I really don't like. For Jenna, that would be seaweed. I guess kind of playing back to the ocean thing. Mm. She gets pissed when I give Leo really? seaweed, and he loves seaweed. But yeah, she's she like basically leaves the room every time I do that. I've got one that's in like the sandalwood category in my mind, and I can't put my finger on it, but I hate it, and I don't remember what it's called. Mm. But sandalwood, I like. Um, I'm gonna go anything like too tropical. I love I love a like a fall cozy, winter cozy, holiday esque fruit, like an apple, like a you know, or like a mold mold wine. I'm gonna fuck a mold wine candle. I hate mold wine. Mm. There we go. Okay. I thought it through. There it is. But also like really tropical fruits, like a pina colada. I'm out on that. Huh. Have you guys ever seen the list of Yankee candles? It's like the levels of abstraction where no. it, like it goes there's all these different levels. So like level one would be something that like is named what like what it smells like, like black cherry or apple or something like that. But then as you go they get for like more and more abstract until they become like an idea or a feeling. <laughs> like there's a candle that Yankee candle makes called sweet nothings. <laughs> like what does sweet <laughs> it represents it's yeah, the scent represents a property detached from any object. The absence of an object is in fact part of the scent. Yeah. I feel <laughs> like you could make some candles based on your uh, top eight, your MySpace top eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely could. Yeah. Maybe a well, lot they, of desert sage, yeah. probably. Yeah. They also have those, um, like, reminds me of home candles where it smells like your home state. And I mm. I don't know why anyone would buy a candle scented like New Jersey. Yeah, Illinois is probably on the do not sniff list. You could get some, like, nice farm crops, have like a freshly like, mowed lawn. Like a dairy farm? No, not one of those. Yeah. Like, I'm thinking, like, a nice, like, mowed pasture. Like, the, the scent of mowing yeah. would be a good one. You can tell when a front is coming in from the north here in Colorado. Cause yep, it smells like cow shit. Yeah. Um, my last pick here, I'm going to go with Summer Zoo. The fuck is that? Just like <laughs> when it's so hot outside, you can smell it's cooking exotic animal feces. And like, especially oh. when you get to the indoor arenas, so there's not the ventilation. Um, maybe the nicer zoos don't have this, but some of the less nice zoos are not cleaning the feces fast enough for my liking but yeah if you really want to make a, a shitty candle summer zoo is the one maybe like a like a desert cow trough yeah that'd be a, that sounds like a name that they would use sure do you have a last one you want to rock with i, I think desert cow trough i'll take that one too. <laughs> sure you can have that one that recently <coughs> uh quickly a couple honorable mentions compost okay compost is no good and uh an old synthetic gym shirt. I love Merino because you can wear those forever and they don't become perpetually stinky. But like the, the synthetic, the polyester shirts, there's just no reviving them. Once they get bad enough, it's just like, whoof, whoof. I've got a scent of my own to honorably mention that I um, accidentally bottled. And that was tent after a through hike. Mm. that you accidentally left screwed into your bear canister for an entire winter. You're describing mildew. Mildew's a good one, actually. Yeah. I opened the bear canister the following spring, and that, that was like I had lit in a, like a three-wick candle and burned it for five days. And I don't think there's anything you can do for mildew either. I think that's just like a, you got to burn the tent and turn it into a candle. Did you keep it? I still use that. Uh, <laughs> you can, you can bleach <coughs> the scent goes away yeah. if you're around it enough. Yeah. I think you can bleach it, but it never fully gets it out. You know. Yeah. yeah. Or you could also lower your standards. <laughs> <if> <laughs> that is the true answer. Um, five star review. I know you love reading. Good stuff. Etna Poppy. Can't say how long I've been listening to this show for now, maybe four years, but I love how they dive into a conversation and keep it going. Simply, I love how long the show goes for. Thanks, guys. All right, plus one We're on long shows. shows right now. We're at like two and a half hours. Let's go. We've done it again. Yeah. Uh, if you want to hear your review read right on the show, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave any number of stars as long as it's not one, two, three, or four. Sticker code. Ooh. Hmm. 
Um, Should we people give their MySpace top eights? That's a lot for a comment. What I about would, what about top three? MySpace three. The best bad candle they can come up with. Ooh, okay. Like yeah, that. come up with your um, your your worst candle. Yeah. Tell us what it is. Because uh, I think if you try to be too funny, you're almost not funny with this. You know, like there's almost a level where you go too far. Like mm-hmm. farts isn't too funny. No. Because it's like try hard. Low hanging fruit. Yeah. So you have to use some creativity to win over Mara's stickers. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to talk for a second because I'm pulling up the current Patreon. Sure. Um, this is me. Uh, my name is Chaunce. Okay, Here are some it. words. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the Chuck Norris Award winners on Patreon. That is Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting, Andrew, Austin McDaniel, Austin Ford, Brad and Blair from 13 Adventures, Brent Stenberg, Christopher Marshburn, Dane, Ish. Derek Koch. Do we have one for that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Just like, we should start a business together. <laughs> no. <laughs> DoGoodPantry.org, Greg McDaniel. Liz Seeger, Matt Suka, Mike Poizel, Patrick Ciencialo, Sawyer Products, Timothy Hahn, Solo, Tracy Trigger. Hans. <laughs> um, you can follow us on social media at Backpacker Radio on Instagram and TikTok. TikTok's still going. TikTok is still alive. Are we still doing TikToks? We are still doing TikToks. Nice, sweet. Uh, Twitter is at BackpackerPod, Facebook.com slash Backpacker Radio. Yeah, I know. I, st- I still don't really know if you're serious when you say that. I mean, I don't tweet, but. Mara's killing Mara, it. Mara tweets. Yeah. Why? Wild. You can follow Lila on Instagram at Seltzer Skelter. You can follow Chance. You can find me on Instagram at Juliana underscore Chauncey, and you can get my book Hiking from Home, a long distance hiking guide for family and friends on Amazon. Appalachian Trials and Pacific Crest Trials are my books. Subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on YouTube. We're on YouTube. This will be on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. What's up, YouTube? Hello, Internet. Thanks for stopping by. Bye. I then I was talking to the YouTube people. I wasn't actually signing off. Oh, okay. Thanks for listening and happy hiking. Bye. There we go.